Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, MJ, and I'm so excited to bring you season three of the Black Wine Guy Experience. I'm not going to lie. Season two was pretty epic. We had so many Mavericks, including Pascaline LaPeltier, Audrey Frick, Eric Azimov, Carlton McCoy, Kevin Zraeli, Rita Jame, Soil Pimp, Neek Sam, Victoria James, and so many more. If you missed any, now's the time to go back and catch up. And if you can believe it, this season has just as many dope guests as season one and two, because that's just how we do it. I can't thank you all enough for listening, subscribing, rating, and reviewing. Your supportive DMs and messages keep me striving to be better and keep bringing you the real conversations from the mavericks, deep thinkers, and philosophers who inhabit the world of wine. Cheers and peace. Yeah, I think that was a great one. No. Oh, is it, does the air, the air doesn't seem to be on. Is it on? Because <laughs> I know, is it? Yeah. It's hot. I can't breathe. Yeah, I take the sub. I get around on a bicycle in the subway, and it's just, and I came from the gym, and I'm just, oh, I just, and I just missed my F train coming down here, so I had to wait on that platform for 10 minutes, and I'm like soaked. Right. Yeah, the LIR, so I came in from Queens, and the LIR was delayed, so I jumped on the bus. All right. So I jumped Yeah, it's. R ready when you are, Lonnie. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience Before the Poor, aka 20 Questions with MJ. My guest today is chef, author, radio and TV host and restaurant expert, Michael Colomeco. Uh, Michael is a graduate of the CIA, that's the Culinary Institute of America. He was the class of January 82. After graduating from the CIA, he worked at the Four Seasons Restaurant, Windows on the World, uh, particularly Cellar in the Sky, the Maurice, Tavern on the Green, and at the age of 31, he was the executive chef of the Ritz-Carlton, New York City. Mike was also the chef and owner of Globe Restaurant in Cape May, New Jersey for many years. He was the host of Mike Colomeco's Real Food, which was one of the most popular and enduring cooking shows in the history on NYC's iconic PBS Channel 13, WNET, and to this day, he still hosts a little segment called The Bite. In addition, he was the host and producer of the live call and radio program Food Talk, once again on New York's iconic radio station WOR 710 AM for six years. And from 2012 to 2015, he was the host and producer of Mike Colomeco's Food Talk on the Heritage Radio Network. Uh, Mike is the author of Mike Colomeco's Food Lover's Guide to New York City, which was published by John Wiley and Sons in 2009. He has written for Savor, Guitar Aficionado, Edible Manhattan, and Edible New Jersey. Welcome, Michael. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, that's your, your well, you've oversold me already. <laughs> Downhill from here. <laughs> well, you know, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to warm up a bit. I'm going to ask you some personal questions, followed by James Lipton's 10 famous questions from inside the Action Studio. The key is just answer them quickly. First thing comes to your head. This is not being scored except for funniness and humor. Other than that, let it rip. Okay, you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. What is your favorite book? <laughs> Dharma Bums, <laughs> Kerouac. Oh, nice. Very nice. What is your favorite movie? <sighs> Jaws. Oh, man. That scared the shit out of me. I think I was like eight or nine when that came out in 75. And my dad took us, me and my sister. I think it would be okay because it was. I mean, we live near the beach, but he thought it'd be okay because we're in a movie. Man, Nightmares that whole summer. One of the scariest movies. At that time, it was like Exorcist scary. Anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who's your favorite musical artist? Oh, God, I got huge ears. Um, bah, bah, bah. Right now, I'm listening to a lot of Bill Frizzell, the guitarist, the jazz guitarist. Nice. He's, I play the guitar, and he's like one of my gods. Okay, awesome. Um, what is your favorite food? It's Death Row, Last Meal. What is Mike having? Probably like a big, like like dinner at Coat, Korean barbecue with all the banchans and all the fermented stuff, and maybe some saran, some champagne. Ah, I'm down. Invite me to your last <laughs> supper. <laughs> all right, who's your favorite athlete? Ali. Nice, he's mine too. My, matter of fact, I have on Ali socks right now. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> that's great, I literally. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Um, Favorite cartoon growing up as a kid? Bugs Bunny. Hilarious, classic. 
and there was only like five. I mean, even when I was growing up, now they have the no, Cartoon a, Network. The old know? Hanna Barbera. Yeah, thing. It was all hand done, yeah. and the music was Carl Starr. It was just brilliant stuff. Absolutely, still is. Um, what was your favorite cereal? That's like a kind of a stoner question. So we're going with Captain Crunch for <laughs> sure. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I. I'm not admitting or denying anything, but like, you know, in college, that's when I was able to get Captain Crunch because growing up, my mom was like, Frosted Flakes was like a treat. It was like Corn Flakes or Raisin Bran. So I'm feeling it on the Captain Crunch. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, what's your current exercise routine? <sighs> Unfortunately, in, in, my, in my current state of dilapidation, I'm, it's sort of scaling back. So I do these long, soft sand walks on the beach. So instead of walking on the hard sand, I'm up on the soft sand, which is kind of, you know, I used to run on the soft sand, but my knees are not allowing me to do that anymore. Uh, my open water swim in the summer, so I'm an ocean swimmer. Off season, I'm in the pool. And then just tons of natural body weight stuff and weights, you know, push ups, crunches, planks, all that stuff. Ever since COVID, we sort of have a, figured out what to do out of a gym because that boxed us out. So it's been just lots of natural body weight stuff. I love it. I love it. Um, who's your favorite comedian? Probably, I mean, Lenny Bruce was a real, I mean, I have him on vinyl, but I think, I mean, Dave mm. Chappelle's just hard. Dave Chappelle's just hard. I know. He's kind of slid in past Bruce and Pryor at this point. He's, uh, he's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. He's just, I mean, that show, I couldn't believe that. I used to watch it and wonder how that ever got broadcast. Right. <laughs> like, there's just no way. He's, he's not going to go there. Yeah. yeah he, he totally went there every time. <laughs> I agree. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've shared many a bottle of wine in your lifetime, but who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? Vascaline. Mm. Very nice. Very nice. Um, she was awesome to have a bottle of wine. Very intriguing intelligent she's yeah deep deep yep. deep yeah 100 percent um okay now we're going to get into the questions that james lifton has made famous on inside the actor's studio michael what is your favorite word um it's gonna be a weird answer but i play the guitar and there's a guy in new york on carmine street Carmine Street Guitars, Rick Kelly is the proprietor and the luthier. And he makes guitars that are of old, old New York pine from like the s buildings in the Bowery, the Chelsea Hotel. When they would dismantle these buildings, he would re he'd find out they were doing it and just get a bunch of guys and haul it. So I, old growth pine is my favorite wood as a tone material for guitars. Oh, man, that, that's, I love Weird that. Weird answer. No, but that's why we ask these questions. <laughs> That's so dope. They should do a show, like old growth pine guitars. Like instead of barnwood builders, like. We tried it and it didn't fly. But uh, then there was a guy, J he, Jim Jarmish is a big fan of Rick's. And okay. Jim has a guy, Ron Mann, who's the documentary guy from Canada who did a great documentary on Rick. And it played all around. It won a bunch of awards. So it's actually, it's available if you want to pay for it on Netflix. And my scene got cut out. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Whatever. Who's the editor? Like, what? <laughs> Like, I got cut? Like, what? Do you, don't you hate when that happens? Just <laughs> seriously. Like, you, you, Bill Frizzell's in there, and I'm not? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, then. What is your least favorite word? Word. Okay. Um, I thought you said wood the first time. Yeah. Sorry. I fucked that up. That's so Sorry. awesome. Um, that's dope. That's, this is, this is, listen, this is, that's so perfect. Because we use these, it's like, a wine bonus, show. I well, no, this is bonus material outtakes. Um, I usually... I'm sorry, that's my Jersey accent, man. That's my bad. No, it was probably my old ears. <laughs> Least favorite word. I'm um, going to change that question to what's your, what's your, what's your fav most favorite word? <laughs> yeah, I could get a lot of answers, so you might not want to go there. Um, <laughs> this is the, you know, I changed the question because my mind went somewhere that someone else never went to. So anyway. <laughs> How about the word tis? Because no one uses it. Oh, tis yes. the season to be. Like, that's a word no one says. So it's like tis. Yeah, tis. If, you, if, if, if someone brought that up, like, colloquially, I'd be like, what? <laughs> I'd be saying, like, alas. Okay. Alas. Tis the time for the next question. <laughs> what turns you on? Um... I mean, I guess basically just talent that's trained. Mm. People that hone in and are great at what they do and they have the ability and then they just put in the – Just I, I'm a big sports guy, so yeah. it's just the kind of – Or a music guy, so yeah. you watch the people that are great and you just think how they get there and the answer is A, they're great, and B, they practice like insane. 
Yeah. So yep. people um, that really polish their whatever their gift was. Mm, I love it. There's a book called Town is Overrated, which is all about that. And then also to your point, I mean, you know, Kobe Bryant was the first one in the gym and last one out the gym. That's, yeah, that's him, what the Larry thing, Bird, and then I had friends that you know, I wanted Bill Frizzell, who's this guy who's coming up again and again, but you know, this remarkable jazz guitarist. And then I had friends that used to tour with them who were producers, and they'd be like in Copenhagen with the day off, and hey, you, where's Bill? I don't know. They go knock on his door. Bill, you want to go to the museum? What are you doing? I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. That's you know, you put in six hours a day on on, on your acts, and suddenly, it does sound like magic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What is your, um, actually not, I asked that one, what turns you off? You know, this will kind of sound generational, but as social media began to take off and people began to get into like the whole selfie thing, like that <laughs> just, dry, like people with selfie sticks, like, or, or, you go, or you go to a concert and people are holding up their phone filming and you can't see the stage. Like, oh, you're man. at the concert. Exactly. Why do you need a shitty recording on your iPhone? <laughs> your hands, just listen, you're here. Right. So, I mean, that kind of stuff. That I wish people could just be in the moment without having to capture it all for whatever reason they have to capture I, it. I agree, and I'm guilty of that. But also, I say, I'm like, sometimes, you know, with the wine, I'm like, I don't put everything, drink, every dinner, every wine I drink on. So I sometimes want to be in the moment. And... And the same, especially with a live show, yeah. I agree with you. That, that's the worst I me. almost stopped going. Well, actually, I did for a while. stopped going to concerts in New York because it was just like, forget about it. Like, I used to go and there was this the thing. You'd listen. It was great. Now it's just yep. Yep. hands the up in time. the air like, yeah. what are you yeah. doing? That, that's annoying. Um, what sound or noise do you love, Michael? We'll say what again? What sound or noise do you love? Um, a beautifully played piano. Mm. I like jazz piano and classical piano. There's something magical about that instrument that's kind of, you know, cello's great, guitar's great, something about a piano that just can sort of... It, it's kind of, people don't get, it's, it's the ultimate um, string instrument. People don't realize yeah. the piano's a string instrument. Right, and it's percussive as well. Right. Because you have those hammers going, and the guy like Monk who brings out that, or McCoy Tyner who was a real percussive piano player in the jazz idiom, but piano's just always beguiled me as to what a beautiful instrument it was, and I could never play it. <laughs> Neither can I. Um... What sound or noise do you hate? Um, <laughs> we're going to sound like an, like crappy music being played on someone's iPhone that you can <laughs> listen to on the subway. Like, oh, my God. Put in headphones. <laughs> like, so they have dude. ear pods for that. I dude. do not want to listen to this. Exactly. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I sound like the, the – I'm the old guy in the train uh, that's always well shaking then, his I head. Mean, I, I'm not – listen, I'm that dude, too. I'm like, come on, man. Look, come on, bro. <laughs> Like, like headphones are like you can get headphones for five dollars. Yeah, come on, there's no excuse not to have headphones. Um, <clears throat> what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be fuck. Yeah, I mean that just comes out voluntarily. That's probably the last thing I'll say is fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it is so versatile. Like you're like fuck, fuck. I mean you can just use it so many you ways. Know, so I, I have two sons and. We had moved, we had lived in Cape May, and then we moved up to North Jersey for a couple of years in Maplewood, to be specific, to try out the birds. And I wasn't crazy about it, but while I was there, I had a bunch, of, I had a bunch of balls in the air, and I had an import business, and I had a restaurant. And my one son was in daycare, and I hated, I hated daycare, I hated dropping. And so I decided, you know what? I'm not going to take him to daycare anymore. I'm done with this. It just, it sucks. He doesn't like it. Feel, I feel like I was dropping a kid off in a kennel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the alternative was he comes to the restaurant with me. Bad move. <laughs> So the restaurant's not open by day, but I'm on the phone with guys, and people are coming in and out. And literally by the time he was four, he could make you blush. Like, he just had it down. Oh he could God. curse like a <laughs> Bronx. He just learned all. And he said, like, he just had it. Like, it wasn't just like, fuck. It was like, no. He would just be all, like, he knew it. It was like, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, that was a really big mistake. <laughs> so bad dad um, advice. Don't do what I did. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, we just got a few more questions. Sorry for going. It's deep. okay. No, I love for going deep. That was yeah. It was. <laughs> Sorry, Johnny, if you're listening. He's, that's my son's name. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, yeah. So probably overly romanticized, but um, to be a, a lawyer for the 
for the people being accused of shit. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Like, defense lawyer or right, like defense or lawyer innocence project type or that kind of stuff. Because yeah. we, I, I grew up in Philly and then the main line and then Philly, and I just ever since I was a kid, I mean Frank Rizzo was the mayor of Philly, and I just knew there was like this disparity. So it was just be like that would be something I think I could run with and feel there was a moral nice issue, a moral need for it. And yeah, the innocence project is like perfect. That's yeah. that's the stuff we need more of that stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. I agree. Um, what profession would you not like to do? Dentist. Oh, I thought about. I mean, think about like you're in people's nasty mouths, and no matter when you brush your teeth, the mask has revealed how much you need to brush your <laughs> teeth. Let's put it that way. It just seems like the like all day in people's mouths, and I and then like to go to get your teeth cleaned. That's a good day. That's like the spa day, right? Right. But then to like the other, it's like the worst shit in the world. Yeah. They're just they're putting drills in your head. I know. I you could smell the bones. I know, exactly. And you can hear the crunching. You can it's hear the oh. crunching, and they can see the nurse like shocked as the blood spurts out <laughs> all over, and it's like no. no, no or no. her eyes, but the dentist actually go whoops, but her eyes are like. Oh, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's telling you the truth. Yeah, exactly. I just keep my eyes closed the whole Me time. Me too. Uh. <laughs> they say, "Are you okay?" I'm like, yeah. yeah. The deal was, I, I raised my left hand, but it hurts right. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, you need people. You're gonna start needing a safe word to go to the, the dentist. <laughs> All right, and lastly, <clears throat> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I made a big mistake, Mike. <laughs> or what are you doing here? <laughs> 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 Who let you in? <laughs> Listen, Mike, that was, this was a lot of fun. I'm still cracking up. If you guys want more of Michael, and I'm sure you do after this this uh, 20 questions, make sure you tune in to our episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Peace, everybody. Hey, hey, everybody. What's up? It's your boy, MJ, and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is chef, author, radio, and TV host, and restaurant expert Michael Colomeco. Michael is a graduate of the CIA, Culinary Institute of America, class of January 1982. After graduating from the CIA, he worked at the Four Seasons Restaurant, Windows on the World, Cellar in the Sky, The Maurice, Tavern on the Green, and at the age of 31, he was the executive chef of the Ritz-Carlton in New York City. Mike was also the chef and owner of Globe Restaurant in Cape May, New Jersey for many years. He was the host of Mike Colomeco's Real Food, which was one of the most popular and enduring cooking shows in the history of New York City's iconic PBS channel, WNET Channel 13. In addition, he was the host and producer of the live call-in radio program, Food Talk, also on a New York iconic media outlet, uh, radio station WR7 10 AM for six years. And then from 2012 to 2015, he was the host and producer of Mike Colomeco's Food Talk, on the Heritage Radio Network. Uh, he is the author of Mike Colomeco's Food Lover's Guide to New York City, which was published by John Wiley and Sons in 2009. He has written for Savor, Guitar Aficionado, Edible Manhattan, and Edible New Jersey. And I want to add that he is also the host of the very popular The Bite segment that is currently on Channel 13. Uh, welcome, Michael. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Dude, I'm I'm really uh, excited you're here. Uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of fanboying. You're like OG. You've seen you on TV for years. I watch it every Sunday. Love the bite segments. Um, uh, tell us what we're drinking this afternoon. <laughs> so it's just something simple. It's something fun. I mean, I'd rather brought a chilled white and probably something with bubbles because, in, in the interest of full disclosure, we're recording this in August and it is. I believe it's supposed to hit 92 today. It's it, well, it's definitely 92, and I think the heat index is going to be like 105. Yeah, the humidity so, heat warnings. Right. Yeah. This is definitely like chilled, bubbly weather stuff. But I came here on came to, I went to the gym before I came here, and I was on the subway. So this is a kind of a well, it's not kind of a, it's a natural, real, light-footed Rioja. Okay, which isn't something you hear very often. Yep. Um, it's I buy almost all of my wine from Chamber Street because I, I think you live in Red Bank. Yeah. So I live I live in Lower East Side, and then there I shop at Discovery and Wine Therapy, and Peoples now has a little store in the Essex Market that's great. Um, but Chamber Street's always been so well curated, and mm -hmm. I drive so Varick, 
to the Houston Street to Varick to the Chamber Street exit. There's a f- fire hydrant outside, and they just load the cases <laughs> in the back of my car. And I've got a room in Cape May that has probably 25 cases of wine, all from them. So this is just a great example of what they sell and kind of what I like these days. So it's it's a Rioja, but it sees no oak. It's been in fiberglass. Okay. Slightly high elevation. It's most all Tempranillo with a little 2 or 3% Granat. So it's kind of going to be – It's so it's not the American oak version of the bigger – big boys of Rioja. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. And that's we, that's what I love. I mean, this is about introducing people to wines they don't normally drink them, know about. And so why don't you open that up? Or I open it. I'm going to open it up while I, ask you que- while I ask you questions. So I saw what Kevin did to that, your birth year. Oh, you saw that, man? Woo, man. You saw that screenshot of the cork. I'm like, wh- I have done that. I have done that. But, you know, you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> you know, and, and he was so cool about it. Listen, I got oh, so if many, anybody could with any, right, right, right. I right. mean, he's the guy. Right. I mean, some people are like, "What? Why didn't you have a Duran?" And right. da 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 da. And I was like, "I was like, look, Kevin brought the bottle, and he was. He's like, look, this is what happens. He's like, corks 15, 20 years. This is fifty three years old. Yeah. He's like, and he, he got every piece of cork out. <laughs> yes. But it, it did look like a, a, you know, it was like a wine crime scene. Yeah, it was. You know, it totally like, like, like it was like a, a kick in homicide. It was really bad, um, but so much fun because it's Kevin's really. So what, what are you gonna do? So let's start at the beginning. So uh, our research says you grew up in Philly, uh, the youngest three boys. Tell us about what it's like growing up in the Philly when you were a young man. Well, it was actually great. Um, grandparents were immigrants. My grandma on my mom's side. Um, and her husband, lived not far from us in West Philly. And, you know, it's that typical Italian Sunday thing that everybody talks about that's just the truth. She And she was really old school. She had a kitchen upstairs that was like the fancy tiled kitchen that she basically never used. And she had a kitchen downstairs, which is where you'd always find her. And she was, you know, always everything from scratch back then, handmade pasta, roasted mm. peppers, um, all sorts. And Sunday was just these blowout meals where the extended family and so that was fun. That was a kind of a big influence. And it's that in a way I kind of thought everyone lived like that. And then because when you're a kid, it's like that's and, how and you probably take... everyone in your neighborhood kind of lived they like that. They did, and there wasn't a McDonald's. Like we didn't do like doesn't didn't exist. That wasn't on a radar. There was the guy that made the hoagies, there was the guy that made the cheese shop, there was the pork store people. Um so that was kind of, that was fun. And Philly had a great music scene too, so that was like part of I wasn't really an academic. So both my brothers were, but I kind of, by the time it came to my turn, I was just like, nah. And then it was the 60s, so it was like, you know, early on we discovered girls and drugs and alcohol. (laughs) And that was kind of like, that's all I need? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Like, school? Like, seriously? I remember I think I I flunked Algebra 1 twice, I think. And I went to get my learner's permit. My parents said, you have to go to summer school. And I said, what? I had a girlfriend that was a year older that had a driver's license. And I'm like, no. (laughs) <laughs> I'll, I'll just take it again come the fall I'm not sacrificing a summer so it was fun Philly was cool um, and then well, so I got into the restaurant thing just like I think so many chefs of, of my generation that are my age mm-hmm. it, it wasn't I don't even know if the word chef was in the lexicon you know it was sort of there was like the head cook at the restaurant right, right. Was, there was no food TV it right. wasn't an aspirational calling let's put it that way it. Yeah. if it was career yeah. day and you told your guidance counselor I want to be a chef they'd look at you like are you effing kidding me <laughs> like nobody does that or aspires to that buddy but um, when you're real young I was 13 you either deliver papers which I did and hated it you pump gas which I hated and then I got a job in a restaurant and I just fell in love with it it was just like okay you're around all these older people and they're funny and they're you know, it's a whole different culture and language, and you always have cash in your pocket. Yep, yep, yep. And that was it. So uh, music, I, I thought I was going to be a jazz guitarist, studied in- intently to do that. I was um, weekly lessons for years. And then I realized at some point, 17, 18 maybe, that, you know, I looked around and I thought, you know, you're not as good as the kids that practice five hours a day. And then my heroes were, like, all broke. They all had the, like day jobs. Like name like back then, especially name like three jazz guitarists. This is like nobody knew jazz guitarists wasn't something. Right. I mean, now you can still name maybe half a dozen, but um, so cooking just became the fallback thing. It's what I always did, and I liked being in kitchens, and I kind of liked the the lifestyle. So that's kind of where 
I got to, and then college, I went to Temple for a semester, and it was <laughs> a semester. Yeah. So, so let me. <laughs> me and a buddy of mine lived in an apartment in West Philly above a pizza joint, and uh, it was, you know, it was your typical. Yeah, uh, bacchanal of uh, your typical. Six, late 60s, early 70s, yeah, going to college. Yeah, 74 was drugs. And, and then the high school I drugs. went to. So we, my parents <laughs> moved back. We lived on the main line for a while. Then my parents moved back to Overbrook when I was in high school, which I'm like, I, when I think about that, I'm like, what were you thinking? Because Overbrook High School is a really tough high school. Then. I know. It was 98% black. There yep. were cops in the hallways. Yep. Um, and so I somehow got some kind of a weird scholarshipy thing to go to Lower Murrayan's alternative school, which was this hippie high school they had. Me and a couple of kids from Winfield, which was another... Overbrook and Winfield were contiguous West Philly neighborhoods, so we would just carpool and drive out to the main line and and sit around in um, circular classrooms and do nothing. It was that <laughs> experimental education, and then it got even. Then I get to I get to the point where I'm going to graduate, and I know I don't have enough credits. And this is a, so this is like a hippy dippy. This is this is like experimental ed, early '70s. So I went into the the office, the main principal's office, and there was nobody there. And I opened up the file cabinets and I took my files home. I took the whole thing, the Mike Colomeco file, and then it gets better. Then I'm like cutting school three days later, and the phone rings at home, the landline, I pick it up, hello, and it's the school. Hey, Mike, we're just calling. You're not in today. Yeah, I've got a headache or whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I got another dime bag. I'll see you next week. And they said, so what, well, Mike, we're looking for your records. And I said, oh, I have them. And they're like, what? And they're like, yeah, I just wanted to see what that fifth grade teacher said about me. It was just, I was curious. And it was so, it went up the chain really fast to like the superintendent of law, and they were like, we don't know what to do. And, we, <laughs> and I changed stuff so like like P's became B's and one credit became like, four. That's, that's how I got out of high school. That's not act like you like. <laughs> no, that's how, literally how I graduated high school. Otherwise, I would have had to move on back, which would have been a nightmare. And so, after, so college obviously that wasn't a college prep kind of a track I was on. <laughs> um, duh. So. After f basically just floundering around at Temple. And this was when you could get into Temple with just a pulse. Like right. anybody could get into right, Temple. Right. It was a city school in yep. North Philly that was just, yep. there were no standards. It was like, yep. can you sign your name yep. and tell us the between black and white? Good, you're good. You're coming in, kid. And um, so then, so I just decided to go to the CIA because it seemed like my, my brothers were college graduates and smart. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I guess a degree, you know, I, what, I, my, what, do they, what do they give you at the CIA? A bachelor's? Well, I don't even know what it is. It's not a bachelor. Associate's degree. Okay. It's an AOS, whatever the hell that is. But back then, the CIA was cheap. So that's what led me to, to the CIA. And then when I graduated, it was just, you know, Philly back then, just was, there was no restaurants. It was Lebec fan with George Perrier. I mean, that was yeah, a great yeah. restaurant, but that was it. And then it was Bookbinders, which is just like every other generic seafood restaurant from that, mm -hmm. you know, broiled, fried, baked fish of some type. Um, and then cheesy Italian restaurants. So my, everybody wanted me to come home to Philly, and I'm just like, nah, I'm going to go to New York. And I knew nothing. Literally, what I knew about New York when I came here, you could write on the back of a postage stamp. I knew nothing about the city. I just thought, this is where the restaurants are. And also kind of, I didn't want to get back into the whole drug partying thing, which I knew if I went back to Philly. Well, you got to, you know where your connections are. So it's a new That's what city. I mean. Yeah, right. So new cities, like here's a chance to invent yourself. Right. Here's a chance to reinvent yourself. Here's right. a chance to say, okay, we're not doing any of that old shit. We're going to go, we're going to just go hardcore, find a job, work hard. Um, I had boxed and I wanted to join a boxing gym. I had a black belt in Philly and I wanted to join a dojo. Put that on hold and wait till I get, get settled. And, and luckily the rest was just kind of kismet. It just worked. So where the CIA, that's, um, where's Pogip that? Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie. Well, Hyde, yeah, Hyde Park, just north of Poughkeepsie. Okay. So what was that like, the change of going from, like, West Philly, you know, to you know, Hyde Park? It was, fa it, 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 I really, really, I wouldn't, I would not recommend cooking school to people today, honestly. I would tell mm -hmm. you to tell your kids to, if you think they want to go into this, that business, my business, go work in a restaurant for free. Just find out if you, don't incur seventy five or eighty thousand dollars worth of students. Is that debt. much now? It's ridiculous. And this Shit. is the, all the the French culinary or whatever they call it now. It's an expensive proposition. So I so I get to the CIA and I'm a bit older. I'm in my mid I'm like twenty two, twenty three, and I loved it because it was suddenly I mean, this was the old CIA, too. It's so when I went up there recently to do talks and stuff, it looks like Princeton. But this was, <laughs> like, Roth Hall was the big old building, and that was kitchens and dorms and a library. And then there were three dorm rooms, A, B, and C, and uh, that were just, like, cinder block gulags down by the river. And that's where we lived. There was nothing. There was no gym. There was no media. There was nothing. Um, but it was great for me because 
I just had this brain that wanted to learn about classical cuisine. I knew mm -hmm. Italian, I knew stuff, but mm -hmm. I didn't know French food. Mm -hmm. And so I would, you know, I would, if there was a better teacher in AM than PM, I would take the AM class and the PM class. In my off days, I'd be up in the library reading about truffles, you know, what's tuber melanosporum, and how do you make this sauce? And, and I was also broke, so I was an RA in the dorms, my, my second half, so you get free room and board mm -hmm. to do that. And you get to meet all the incoming girls. Of course. <coughs> oh. And you got to show them around. How you I met my, excuse me. Thing. Met my wife. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh. Yep. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding. It all worked. <laughs> and I worked off campus. So CIA was, was great. For me, it was great. I just, I really loved it. I really squeezed every drop I could out of that sponge. And, um, I, you know, I came out stoked and ready to come to New York, I thought. And, of course, January, as you mentioned, January yep. is when I graduated. And there, back then, there's nobody's hiring in January. It's like. Right the dead season. So I got a little job at the Vista. I had a little illegal sublet down in Tribeca in a Mitchell Llama building, 310 Greenwich, right across from Tribeca Grill, actually. Okay. And I got a job at the Vista Hotel with the explanation that I might not stay that long, but I'd be happy to work there. And then I had to, you know, back then you were like, I don't know, you bought like Mimi Shorten's book or something. You literally went around with resumes and knocked on doors. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any other way to get this done. I know, it's crazy. And man. all the restaurants were kind of, you know, East, Upper East, Mid, like 50, all the Le Lala restaurants, La Cote Pasta, La Cine. There, were, there weren't that many restaurants either. I mean, there was nothing in Tribeca, nothing in Soho. So the, it was a very different town. Mm. And somehow I got on the, I, got on the I, I went to the Four Seasons and Seppi called me after I had been at the Vista and he offered me a job. And I was like, fuck, this was, at that time, that was like really one of the best restaurants in the city, if not the country. Uh, they were just uh, Paul Covey and Margatai, Tom Margatai were the owners. I, um, the guys, Alex von Bitter and Julian were their understudies. They were in the kitchen, and Seppi Renko was this brilliant Swiss chef. This is brilliant. The kitchen was really brilliant. It was a fantastic place to work. It was the most wonderful first serious gig I could have gotten. So that's awesome. So I think a lot of people have read or know Anthony Bourdain. They've read Kitchen Confidential. Um, he talks about like the New York City restaurant scene was kind of notorious for hard partying in the 80s and 90s. Um, how did you do? Uh, not falling back into that. I've come yeah, no, because, so, yeah, it gets back to my other point. I, I wasted pretty much 10 years of my life, and I knew it. I was, even, even though I was an idiot, I mean, most guys are idiots up to a certain age, yeah. if not forever. But um, at some point, it just dawned on me, hey, if you, if you keep doing blow and lewds and <laughs> drinking shit, you're just going to go nowhere. You're just going to be a bum. That's just how it works. There's nothing in this that leads you anywhere but right. nowhere. Right. And so, yeah, so when, uh, so, I kind of got to that earlier. What I wanted to do was get a st get a job, get established, and be able to pay my rent, which okay. wasn't easy to do. Yeah, um, six days a week to four seasons. I think I was taking home one eighty seven a week. That's another thing too. I, to, to your other other point about <clears throat> even to this day, um, you come out with eighty k, seventy five k in student loan debt. Like you, you're working eighty hours a week in a kitchen under somebody, and you're not making you're not making shit. No, making it's no a, money. The restaurant. One of the things as we come out of COVID to just slightly change the subject is that's what restaurants are dealing with now. That was your last segment of the bite. You were talking about that. Later. Yeah, there's going to be you know there's going. I think the industry probably lost a million employees around the country that were like prep cooks, food who just said f it. And now I've got a job at a Target, or I've got a job at a fulfillment center, or I'm working at a supermarket. But they're paying me 17 or 18 an hour, and it's regular hours, and I'm not catching the, the last subway at 2 in the morning back to Nowheresville, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the restaurant business is going to have to start to have pay equity for the back of the house. Because mm -hmm. it's never – it's. I was part of that culture that we, were, we weren't part of the problem. We didn't know any better. But right. That was sort of the badge of honor was, you know, you worked 75 hours and got paid for 35, and you never called in sick, and you never – you do, do, do it was just hard for – you know, do, you cut your finger, you put a side tail on it and work the shift out, man. That's how it was. Yeah, yeah. But to answer your question, so I didn't party because you hit the nail on the head. So everyone's going out after we're getting fucked up, and I'm just like, nah, I got the – I'm going to – I joined Gleason's gym back when it was south mm -hmm. of the garden – it was inexpensive. It was like $25 a month to get a locker there. And I and I I had a black belt already from Philly. I called my old dojo, my old instructor up, and I said, hey, there's two or three. It was a really weird Okinawan style. There's two jo three dojos up here. He said, you know what? You like to box, and you like to do karate. There's a style called Kyokushin Kai that mixes them up. It allows you to fight the way you want to fight. Okay. You can't throw a left hook in, in the karate dojo. It is not part of the vocabulary. Right. But the way you like to fight, and I, so I did. I went to the Kyokushin Dojo, put a white belt on, walked in, and so that was, I would get up early in the morning every day and work out. So that's kind of what kept me, like, 
on that path and no way you can do that and go at it night and party no well, for sure for sure so you mentioned it so how did you like how did you actually land the gate four season just knocking on doors knocking or? on doors and knocking on doors and seppi was a really tough guy to work for and then it's, a, it's this even crazier story so I'm the nighttime entremetier, which means I'm doing all the veg stuff, and I'm on the line, which is a good position to be. So I'm working service in the middle, and I'm, my rent was almost 500 bucks a month. Take-home pay is 187 and I had some student loans, and, of course, you have to eat and do laundry and stuff. So Damn. my wife was an intern from the CIA, that little thing you do in between where they send you out to the field before you come back and finish your last eight, nine months, and she was at the Maurice. And a couple of knuckleheads who were working for Christian Delivery at the time, a, a sous chef and a uh, associate, were having a party, and they stole some, tried to steal some stuff from the restaurant. And the Maurice was a hotel restaurant, and it has security. Like, you're literally walking out the back door. And they walked out the back door, and security stopped him, and they were fired. So Christian said, you know, he, suddenly he was two men short. So he needed somebody, and I thought, hmm, Okay. He asked Ajun what I was doing. So I don't know how I ever got the cojones, but I went up to Seppi, who was the chef, who wasn't the most approachable guy. And I said, hey, chef, I love working here. I love working here, but I'm kind of going broke and I have an opportunity to work nights at the Maurice. Can you switch me from AM to PM? And can I come in a little early and leave a little early? Because the shifts don't exactly match up. I, I can't do both the way it's – and he did. So I came in, and I would come in early and fill up the Bay Marie's and unlock the walk-in boxes and get water boy, just busy work. And then I would skedaddle out early, shoot across town from Lexington Avenue to, to the Maurice, get there. And for seven months, I was two line shift jobs six days a week wow. until Christian offered me the sous chef job. And that was a big jump in pay. So that kind of got me out of the Four Seasons. But Seppi was funny. You know, I, did, I was such a kind of like clueless. So his name, his name is Wrinkly, R-E-N-G-G-L-I. Seppi, Seppi Wrinkly, right? Okay. It's kind of kind of Italian name, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, <a> <laughs> no, no. So one day when I had got the courage and, you know, he had this neckerchief and the mustache and his hair was kind of this. And he had a stiff way of, uh, he didn't turn his head. He was kind of, uh, <laughs> and he would also get, go out after him and Christian Alvin Hitch was his nickname him and Hitch would go out and Seppi would get wasted between lunch and dinner and he would come back and he'd be kind of on a on the rampage but anyway I remember asking him one day so so chef what part of Italy are you from and he turns his head and he looks at me and he says Italy Italy if I was Italian I'd shoot myself in the head standing in shit <laughs> wow yeah okay gotcha got that part of Italy gotcha <laughs> Guess what he said? I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'm like, okay. And then I realized later on when I began to understand European culture, it's the Swiss. You know, they have an Italian section called Ticino, but oh, right. they're Swiss. Right, you know, it's right, the, right. the Swiss of the Swiss. There's kind of. That's yeah. fucking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, how'd you end up at um, Windows on the World, Cellar in the Sky? Um, I had been at the Maurice before that. Okay. And I heard about the opportunity. So the cellar was this outlier restaurant that really was way ahead of its time. So it was within windows, but it was only 35 tables. Mm -hmm. It booked out constantly like a month in advance. It was a set menu. There were, you sat down and everyone got the same thing. So it was a seven course meal. And back then, I guess nobody had any allergies or whatever. <laughs> because I'm just. <laughs> oh, that, my God. <laughs> right. Like That's every, a whole other thing, too. Oh, my right, God. Right. Right. So, anyway, so. Wow. And, so, Kevin did the. <laughs> so, it was a seven course meal. Kevin did the wines for all the pairings. Okay. And you had to give a credit card and a deposit to get the reservation. I and mean, this was, we're talking 1985. Like, what? And, and we're on credit card, we're talking. You had to walk in and they had to do a knuckle buster. The whole thing. So, like, there, there was no, like. Resi or any of this shit. No, this was the old eight days. They kept like a ledger with handwritten stuff. So, so, and there was this one guy, one chef that did everything. So you did amuse bouche, all you did everything from appetizers, to all the courses, and dessert. It was a dream job. Um, and my, my the executive executive chef was Herman Reiner, who I'm still in touch with. A wonderful guy, German guy. But the actual my boss was a guy named Eberhard Mueller who's a really brilliant guy. You wouldn't know Eberhard now because history moves quickly, 
But Eberhard worked with Alan Sandrons at Orchestra in Paris. He's a fan. Eberhard is just a fantastic technician. Mm. When Le Bernardin first opened with Gilbert Lacoze in the kitchen, Eberhard was actually the chef. I mean, Lacoze was like the visionary guy right, with right, the big right. hat on and, you know, <laughs> doing blow. And I, 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 but the guy that was making that kitchen right. go, the right. real general, was Eberhard. Right. Uh, so he was my boss. And so I got to work with Eberhard directly on menu creation. It was, like, fantastic. And, and But what they used to do was they'd give you that job for a year, and then they'd say, now become part of the Windows family and do Windows. I didn't want to do Windows. Yeah. Windows was – you know, 700 covers, and it yep. was, I knew what it was. It yep. was a, a touristy thing, and food wasn't – it just wasn't what I wanted. Um, and th But then, ironically, I, I say this, but then my next job was Tavern on the Green because I'd sort of done – so Four Seasons was three-star New York Times. Maurice was three-star New York Times. All those guys, but it was all precious. It was the equivalent of, like, tweezer food back then. We didn't have tweezers back then, but it was the equivalent. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, as a young chef, like, you need – I'm thinking five years ahead. My resume has to sort of be A, B, C. You have to, you're building the foundation to yep. a career, right? So it was all – it's like Tavern was like the highest grossing restaurant in America. It just was. It was $33 million back then. And it was a legendary restaurant. So I'm saying, you know, fine dining, fine dining, and then you do Tavern. So it's like, yeah, I can do everything. I can do like the tweezer shit for 30 people, and I can do Thanksgiving for 4000 And Tavern paid like a mofo. Mm -hmm. Like it was double the money I was making. Yeah, yeah. At literally double the money. Like suddenly I went from like a crappy apartment to like a, a triplex on the Upper West Side with the deck out back that, of course, I never used because I work six days a week. But <laughs> it's pretty cool to put the key in the door and walk in. Yeah. I was like, oh, look at my place. My I'm place home. is dope. I, right. And I got this kitchen, the wood-burning fireplace, the thing out back, the loft up. Isn't this great? So Tavern was great, and it was that was also a, that was like a transitional time in New York because we we were the first team of all Americans, top to bottom, to run Tavern on the Green. Before that, Warren Leroy always had like a oh, French right. chef or a German mm -hmm. chef or a Swiss mm -hmm. chef. So uh, m my boss was Stefan Kopf, who worked at Lutess, John Zipperstein, who worked at uh, at, at La Côte Basque in Caraville, Dominic Cerrone. All these guys, they all worked at those Le La restaurants. We were all and we were all stoked, and we, and we we had Warner just. Took up the kitchen. It used to be just chafing dishes and bameries. We said, no, no, everything's a la carte. We're doing everything a la carte. Everything's coming out of, out of the pan. We're not doing anything out of chafing dishes. And so it was pretty funny. It was like trying to do like a U-turn in an aircraft carrier. And we did it. I mean, how good was the food? As good as it could have been considering the volume. But I think we were pretty proud about what, what we were able to pull off. Nice. Um, I just want to go back to um, Cellar in the Sky. Were you big into wine at that moment? or, or No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was not big into wine. I knew Kevin, and I could talk mm -hmm. about it. But honestly, I think, you know, as a young chef coming up, A, we were broke. D if we ever went out to dinner, it was like Chinatown or something, right? right. So, um, and later on, probably around the tavern time, was when I started to get into wine a little more. Okay. And this was when wine was affordable. This is when you could, you were, I remember, like, buying, like, Lynch Bage or, you know, close to first, first growth Bordeaux. They, they were, like, Fifteen, eighteen dollars a 15 bottle, bucks, yeah, right? Man. So that's kind of when I started drinking wine, but I never really got serious until I was out of the industry. Okay. And I also, when I was at the Maurice, my, my our, our, we had a guy at the Maurice, a guy walking around with a test event around his neck. It was before he was an MS, but it was Roger Daghorn. And I don't know if you know R Roger. Mm -mm. Well, he's one of the earliest master psalms well, in that's, America. That's why I like talking to people because there's so many, you know. So Roger taught at Brooklyn Tech. R -A -U Roger, D-A-G-O-R-N. Google him. He's like Yoda. Like everyone in the – he's about five foot four, ill-fitting suits, <laughs> zero self-promotion, is not on social media. And he was the mentor for so many sommeliers coming up. He's also a sake samurai. Like, and so he was in the sake way before it was a cool thing to do. Right. He was on the floor at Chanterelle back in – when Chanterelle was in Tribeca, mm -hmm. and he had this whole sake part of the menu, and like nobody was doing that. So Roger was on the floor at the Maurice, so he was he was fun. But I but I was not into wine okay. until I kind of got out of the industry, and then it, I got into wine, and then it like I divide my wine life, but, but like like AC like before Christ, like before Pascalina, right. after Pascalina. <laughs> Honest to God, so, so I, I had. I don't uh, know if you know AP and BP. Exactly. I don't know if you know who Alice Firing is, but Alice, yes. is, she's brilliant. She's a pioneer. She has been on the vanguard of, of the natural wine scene. She was one of the OGs, absolutely, when, when no one was taking it seriously. And I had her on the radio a couple of times at WOR, and I had no idea. I, she was great, but I didn't know. Like, What's she talking about, natural wine? And I got the, you know, she wasn't into Robert Parker. She mm -hmm. was not into that. I was like, where, where are we going here? And then I met Pascaline when we were filming up at Rouge Tomat when it was uptown. And um, she's just like a force of nature. 
So suddenly began to like taste with her and talk to her and you know socialize mm -hmm. a little bit and, and think of wine differently. Um, and, you know, kind of experience wine differently, spending a lot more time reading about it, a lot more time with my nose in the glass, mm -hmm. a lot more time thinking about what, how we experience wine in all, in, in all the factory in all ways. Mm -hmm. And she just completely turned my, turned me around. That's awesome. Yeah, she's, she's just, I'm so glad you had her on the show. She's just, uh, she's larger than life. Yeah. Uh, we were really glad to have her on. Um, so... <clears throat> You work at the Marie's, you, you tavern on the green, um, and then you're only 31 when you were GM of the Ritz Carlton. Uh, chef, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a funny. So, so yeah. So I get that we I leave tavern, get the job at the Ritz. Um, guy that owned it was John Coleman, who was a funny guy, he's a recovering alcoholic, who's kind of, you know, and he was a business guy. You know, so Ritz Carlton is, was a business to him, and, mm -hmm. and I knew it was going to be a, a challenge because I had been in hotels before. This was when you, a lot of New York kitchens were unionized back then. Okay. People don't realize that. But okay. even though they were unionized, we didn't, it was like we were in the union, but we, had, we got no benefits from it because <laughs> we worked 75 hours and got paid for 30. Right. And if you didn't like it, there's the door because there's a stack of resumes a foot right. deep to replace you, buddy. Right. That's just how it was back then. Mm. So I knew the union was going to be a challenge, but I took the job. Because uh, it was a great opportunity. The Jockey Club was their restaurant, and they had carte blanche, completely redid the menu. And my wife at that point was the pastry chef at the Pierre Hotel, right around the corner. It was a great position. And our plan was to open in New York City. So we had some investors, and we were going to do something here in the city. We had a great idea. And then the stock market, that was October 19th, 87, Black Monday market. There was no off switch. 23% in a day. Just gone. And it's the fourth quarter, and it's New York City. Every other phone call is a cancellation. Every other, and this is true not just for me. This is true every. So I would do, you talk to other chefs, Jean Jacques Rachu, you know Andre Saltner. It was a nightmare. Like people were just canceling. Everyone was broke. I mean, I don't know how many trillions of dollars evaporated, but it was. It, the New York economy would fall into a recession a year or two later. For restaurants, it was just a, a shot between the eyes. We were dead. Oh my god! And our biggest, one of our biggest clients at at, at the Ritz Carlton was Drexel Burnham. Okay. We had these great small banquet rooms, and yep. they weren't a big firm. You know, we couldn't do the Pierre and the Plaza stuff, but we could do boutique -y stuff. And Drexel Burnham was, you know, that's they were, he was in jail, I think, a year or two <laughs> after that. So, so we were screwed. So I said, I'll look, I'll stay till I'll stay through the holidays. I'll get you through Christmas, New Year's, and then I'm going to leave. And my wife kept her job at the uh, at the Pierre, and I was just on a mission I, with our own money. Now I had to sell my co-op. We had to, you know, suddenly budget down and think about doing something outside of Manhattan, and um, that's how we just ac accidentally ended up in Cape May. Yeah, so <coughs> it's like he read our notes. This is uh -oh. awesome. No, Sorry. this is dope. No, you're perfect. Like yes. I was gonna, ask, you, I don't have to. I'm, like. You're throwing your own alley oops. I don't even have to like oh. throw the ball for you. Like you're just you're knocking it out the park. <clears throat> so, uh, when did you open the Globe? That year, the year, the summer after. Okay. Summer yeah, it was just my parents at a house in Cape May Point. I was wasn't a beach person. I didn't know anything about it, and I didn't know anything about Cape May. We didn't do any homework. We probably should have. Um, but, you know, that would be what smart people do. So <laughs> I just went down there, and it was this shitty old restaurant called McGlade's Mansion House. And the kitchen was huge. And it was really – it was like two or three buildings that had been cobbled together over time. It was like a 110-seat dining room with a big kitchen out back. But the cr so, 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 I, so it, my parents heard about it. I see the broker. I make a deal to l l with a lease purchase option. Okay. So we'll, we'll rent it for the summer for X, and if we decide – to pull the trigger, we'll buy it this coming year. Um, and we got luck. And back then, there's no PR. There's no. So I was literally on the phone, like calling up, right. like New York Times, New York Magazine, New Jersey Monthly, the Philadelphia Inquirer. And we actually got a fair amount of really like good press, like Pastry Chef from the Pierre, Chef from the Ritz Carlton, they're in Cape May, whatever. That's the only reason we stayed in business. But the crazy story about that restaurant, and this is crazy, this is a crazy story. I had an uncle named Tony who I never met, a guy who was my father's father's brother's. We, there was the Italians, one of these huge families, like 11 uh, or 12, <laughs> you know, they, no birth control. I had 54 first cousins. They right? were just having, like, babies every year and <laughs> yeah. making more Colomecos. But so it turns out that this restaurant, same restaurant, in the 1950s and 60s was the Sunset Grill run by Tony Colomeco. I'm like, what the fuck? 
So I like that Bogart line of all the gin joints and all of <laughs> like of all of the random restaurants in the world. I end up working in a kitchen that another Colomeco did. Thirty years that's, prior. That's crazy. That is crazy. Because all the people in town, we put a sign up that said, "Mike Hey, Jung Park, Michael Lameco, chef owners." People would come. Hey, are you Tony's kid? I'm like, who's Tony? And I started <laughs> calling my friend. Oh yeah, remember? I never met Tony. No, no. no. Oh, well, him and Antoinette used to live on Broadway, and luckily people loved him. He planted the first fig tree down there, and you know, he just he was uh, hired everybody. So uh, that was a crazy story. But Kate May was a, we were so we were doing everything. We came from New York. I mean, we worked in great kitchens. So, I mean, my tomato sauce was like fresh tomatoes, blanch them, peel them, seed them. It was like, it, and it was Alan Sondran's recipe for market. Just, you know, in an oven. Everything was from scratch. Everything was, mm -hmm. I'm ordering veal bones. But rest of people were like, why are you, just buy, you know, you, you could buy this Norse one. No, 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 I want veal bones. And I want to cut this way. I want this cut. It was like crazy to try and get it. And, and Heijun was baking everything from scratch. And um, the people just kind of, you know, I know you live in Jersey. No, it's okay. No, this is Jersey back yeah, then. Uh, there, was, there was an Italian restaurant caddy corner called Godmother's that literally was like the Cisco truck. Like their tomato sauce was a number ten tin of Cisco's <laughs> chunky tomato sauce with some extra dried oregano and some shit brand pasta. And I, I'm using like the Checo and everything's cooked a la minute and everything's fresh every freaking day. And there would be a line out the door at Godmother's right. a half an hour before they open. It was yeah. like that. It was like the big night with Tucci. Yeah, I lived it. Yeah, it sucked. You know, we'd be looking at a reservation book with like 30 resis, and they'd have 60 people waiting outside at 5 o'clock lining up for like mozzarella sticks. I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on? But that's Jersey. It was like Italian it is, food. It is. And, you know, I, is. I would have pasta on the menu. People would say, where's the salad? It was literally like I watched Big Night once. I said, I lived it. I can't watch that movie again. <laughs> no, no, I do not need to see that movie. It was, it was our experience. So, but on the other hand, you did, um, you were quoted as saying, Kate May isn't Snooky's Jersey Shore. Tell, tell me more well, about Well, sure. That. No, it's really something. So now, see, okay, fast forward to me selling the restaurant, moving north, hating the suburbs, and moving back down again. So the idea was the, like, the, uh, what's, uh, upwardly mobile is the American dream? Yeah. At some point when we left Mabel, what I said, let's just be downwardly mobile. <laughs> we have money in the bank. We have equity in the house. My wife was killing herself, and she was teaching pastry and working here, and I was never home with the kids, and I'm like, I don't want to live like this. So we bought a piece of ground in West Cape May and built a house, um, and the elementary school was 100 yards away, and this is one of these little elementary schools where the class size was like 10. I was a volunteer reader, so I would commit all my kids' classes <laughs> hour a week. And maybe when you couldn't go in the front door, they don't want parents. And I get it, because the parents were just like helicopter parents. You did not want those parents. <laughs> but like Kate May, they needed us. Like right. they, they needed you to staple stuff, and so I would come in and read. It was like, it was like 1950s America. So to answer your question in, in a, with a little less long-windedness. Oh, I love the It's stories, just gorgeous, man. though. So Cape May is this mix of Victorian antiquity, these old houses and tree-lined streets that literally go back a couple of centuries, um, and farmland. We've got tons of farmland. Uh, it, it, the beaches are gorgeous. And it's, you know, I accidentally just got into birding because I live there. Because your big investment is a pair of binoculars at some <laughs> point, And then get your ass into the nature trails and look up. Right. And so, like, it's like one of the two or three best birding places on the planet. It's just a, it's just a function of geography. It, the Atlantic Flyway puts everything through right, Cape it's, May. Right, Cape May's at the end of New Jersey, right? So it's like exit zero. Or, exit zero. It's yeah. Land's End. Yeah. It's like Montauk is to New York, except yeah. mm -hmm. not exactly, but same idea. There's right. nothing <laughs> past it. But so birds travel the coast. That's how they migrate so you know you have the songbirds coming up in the spring and then all the shorebirds come up and i mean right now we've probably got a couple thousand least terns nesting on the beach that are these great acrobatic little historical birds uh american oyster catcher all sorts of gum and then in the fall you get the raptors coming through those big hunting birds and it's just it's fantastic so yeah it's the antithesis of of wildwood and sea isle city and ocean city because uh, I'd say it's 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 better off season than on season. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I I you know I grew up in Long Branch, um, not too far from the shore, and uh, we used to have all that shit, the haunted mansion, water slide. So everybody would come down and converge. Um, but I will say, as someone who was raised in New Jersey and lives in New Jersey right now, those people on the Jersey Shore, most of them were visiting. The Jersey Shore. They're not indicative of the people who yeah. live at the Jersey Shore year round. You know what I mean? Like you said, and that's why the idiots Wildwood Seaside. You know, it's like ah. Um, but I think October is the best month at the Jersey Shore. It's I mean, fantastic. The ocean's still in the seventies, high sixties. Yeah, yeah. The people are gone. The bugs are gone. Yeah. Um, 
And then Cape May is just this wonderful little island town. You know, it's like this. It's literally like I'll go get in my bicycle to go to the post office, which technically takes 15 minutes, and I'll bump into five people I know from because my kids grew up there, so it could be their friends, mm -hmm. it could be their 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 parents, the in betweens. The I know all the beach patrol guys because I swim in the ocean, so you get to know them. So and, and I'll come home an hour and a half later. My wife was like, "Where were you?" I'm like, "You know, I bumped into A, B, C, D, <laughs> and that's the way Cape May is. It's yeah. just it's great that way. I I could not live." Um, I realized that when I moved to Maplewood, how much I missed living by just the smell of the air, just the, the quality of, of, of the light, and um, just there's something beautiful about that. that now, now it's got its hooks in me, so I, I, I don't, can't go anywhere else. Nice, nice. You know what? That's a good uh, point for us to take a quick break. we got to take a break. We'll be back in a few moments, and we'll keep talking to Mike. All right, we're back. So <laughs> let's shift gears, man. Let's talk about... Your career as a media personality. I mean, let's let's face it. You probably know more people in the restaurant business in New York City than 99.1% of people in the restaurant business in New York City. Yeah, we've been. I mean, it's it's um, it's been a great run. I mean, I, I'm like take like Drew Nieper on. He and I are like sort of contemporaneous, more or less the same age. Mm -hmm. Drew worked for Warner at uh, at uh, Maxwell's Plum, and so. Yeah, we just go back. So you remember all the OGs, all the old guys. And then we were kind of part of that first generation of Americans who began to take over kitchens. So when I, I mean, you, 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 in, in context, if you got out of the, graduated the CIA or Johnson & Wales in the late 70s, early 80s, came to New York, the French restaurants wouldn't hire you. Right. I mean, Andre saw it was just like it was just like an agreement that they had. They had French cooks, French sushi. They all spoke the same language. They had a cultural similarity, an affinity to the cuisine. Why would you bring in some kid named Tony or right. Leo? You just why? You know, this guy who is this? He doesn't know anything about anything. So it was impossible. And then the guy that broke that mold was Jean Jacques Rachou at Le Côte Basque. He was just this brilliant guy. And part of it was his story that he was he was an orphan and he had a horrible early childhood. Um, you know, back then to be an orphan in France, you were sort of like a, a third world citizen and you're kind of like a, you know, the people that adopt you kind of bring you, you were help that slept in yeah, the yeah, barn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you were, you were. So he, he was illiterate. I yeah. mean, when Jacques got here, he was illiterate. His wow. wife had to, so Jean-Jacques comes here with this sort of guy that really, you know, Horatio Alger, real life story, who, who, who now is running Le Cote Basque at the time, was one of the great restaurants in America. And he just decided to take a chance with young Americans. So, you know, Charlie Palmer, David Burke, Rick Moon, and on and on. There was a whole so Frankie Crispo. Like, on and on. These young guys that were mentored by Jean-Jacques. And the, they were, the French, were, at one point, they threw him out of the Vitale Club. So we were part of this generation of Americans, like Charlie Palmer, who were beginning to take over kitchens as chefs. And it was kind of a paradigm shift. So the Europeans were being kind of moved over to the side, and we were running with the ball. And that was a, a kind of an interesting time. So, yeah, I mean, Portali was part of that generation. He was in the CIA. He was at school when I was at school. I remember him. Um, and now I have to say, you know, I, I listen to some of the older food writers and some of the older chefs, you know, talking about the good old days and the great old And I'm thinking, like, <laughs> the food is so much better now. Wow. So much better now than it was then. I mean, we used to go to France Every holiday we got, every because we would get summers off, we would take a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. My wife and I would, you know, whatever dollars we had, and convert them to French francs, and go go and visit the three star and two star restaurants and the great bistros in Paris, and you know the bread, the cheese, the butter, the wine. It was all so much better than what we had. There was no Union Square back then. There mm -hmm. was no farm to table movement. It was basically we were all cooking off a Cisco truck. I mean, like it or not, we all, I, you know, restaurants. If if you think about the restaurants of that generation. The menus didn't change. I mean, the Four Seasons was revolutionary because they actually changed the menu four times a year. Right. Le Cote Boston, they didn't. I mean, asparagus was available all year long, right. apparently. Raspberries appeared miraculously in February. Like, what? So, yeah, the food was good with what we had. But then suddenly, it just got so much better here in America. Mm -hmm. As you began to see this connection with farmers' markets and farmers and bakers. I mean, when Drew opened Mon Roche, one of the great claims to fame, you know, David Brule was in that kitchen. Daniel Johannes was in that mm -hmm. kitchen. It was an amazing, amazing crew. Um, 
they they were gay, they were buying their bread from the bakery that baked it twice a day, which was a big deal. Back then, restaurants got their bread delivered at five in the morning. It was curbside, which is why you had bread warmers because by dinner it was stale. Right. I mean, that's that was these were the best restaurants in America. Yeah. So and now wow. you go to restaurants and these kids are grinding their own grain, making bread in house, churning their own butters, going to the farmers. Or I mean, it's a it's a thousand times better than it was. It's it so funny is. you said that. Like, uh, I've had some guests on who've been to the new EMP. I don't know if you've been to the... Not new one yet. No, no, no. But they, they said the bread service. That was like... Some, they were like, they're like the bread <laughs> service. And it's vegan bread. That they're like, they're like, they, they said like, he's created like this brioche, vegan brioche. And they're like, the bread service might be the most amazing thing. So, and and you're right to this day. Like, I there's this... Uh, I can't... What place? Where we go? Oh, this place down in Red Bank. Simolina. Shout out. You guys should sponsor the podcast. I just shouted you out. <laughs> but like, they get their bread... Uh, uh, Par par baked from Brooklyn. They put an oven. The bread ser- it's so like bread service. It's you're so. I remember like you said, go to restaurants when I was a kid. Think it's a nice restaurant, and the bread was all hard. And, but now like you're right. I didn't didn't even pause to think. Also, what, there's a, a pizza place in Jersey City. The guy went to Rutgers. Same thing. They they actually charge for the bread. It's that good. Like they're making the bread. Like it's like Raza. Uh, Raza. He's yeah. insane. Yeah. He's brilliant. He's in, he's out of his mind. He's brilliant. Yeah. He's like an idiot savant with pizza dough. He's, I love him. Dan yeah. Richter's his name. Fantastic yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it's like that. So and, and, and so now we're churning butter in America. Now we have cheese that we make here that's as good as – but that wasn't – so the ingredients here are so much better today. So, yeah. yeah, it's really kind of fun to watch. And then, and then look, it's in, in all honesty. I mean, not only was chefing not aspirational when I was a kid, but my dream was to be a chef. Maybe an executive chef somewhere someday, Mm -hmm. and then maybe have a restaurant. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of food media wasn't something that existed. So all of those paths as they opened up, and I was able to to take advantage or avail myself or find a little niche I could swim in. uh, It's just remarkable. And and now I, 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 you know, you're a wine guy. Here we're at this wine podcast. We're not talking about wine, which is fine with me. But you know, I go to restaurants now. I mean. How many psalms were working on the floor in the 90s? In oh, I talk about it all the time because I got in a wine. When I was in Zero. the business in like, like 98, 98, I was like, I heard about it. I was like, should I get it? Like, no, nah, you don't need it. If you know about wine, you can get a job. Like, you did not need yeah. the, the, to be a psalm. It just, you, you, it was, you knew someone. Like, and and the, the actual four psalms who were in New York were like, they were like French, most of them. Oh, they were all French. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you said just a few seconds ago, like, how did you find your way? How did how did uh, real food come about? How did you find <laughs> your, your, your well? This it was an accident. It's channel. like everything. <laughs> so we were in Cape May. We sold the business. We had a few dollars. I had an import business that was kind of a nation thing that I was building. That was just something to do for a living. And I really I wasn't seeing enough of New York, so I said let's move up north. And I was looking at Montclair specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, for about a year or two, I kept looking at Montclair, Montclair. And finally, somebody said, Maplewood, you should try that town. It's a little less expensive, which it was back then. And I was just driving down a street, and I see a for sale sign, and it's a Bergdorf sign in Maplewood, and that's not a, a Maplewood realtor. And I know enough to say, that's interesting, so it's probably an estate sale. So I, we ended up closing on this house, humongous old center hall colonial. Great, beautiful old bone house. This, you know, back, back the way you built houses in the, in the 19 teens. And one of my neighbors, two doors down, was a cameraman for New Jersey TV. Okay. And his sons and my daughters were the same age, so they were like five and seven. And I was a home, like I said, my kids were home with me all the time. I wasn't a, a daycare kind of guy. So when his daughters came home from school, fine, send them over to my place. You know, we'll eat popcorn and watch King Kong and stuff. Don't worry about it. And uh, he suggested, why don't, you know, he's a camera guy. I think he'd be good on camera. Wonder. And back then, I'm like, for TV, like it was the Food Network, <laughs> like well, you know what a Mike's Meatball Show on the TV. <laughs> it's like bad porn. Like who needs another guy doing like eggplant parmesan my way? I don't want to look at that. So I, you know, he, but he kept. But and I thought, you know, let's do something that hasn't been done. So let's just take a shot of something. Just kind of. So I know chefs well enough. They'll let me in their kitchens. Mm-hmm. And let's do a show where I'm not, I'm the host, but the story is the restaurant or restaurants we're visiting or the neighborhood that we're visiting. And I'm just the lens that people see it through. Mm -hmm. This was back when you're holding a stick mic. We were doing one camera shoots with stick mics. And um, we we shot a bunch of random stuff. We we did a a, a gamioke on 32nd Street, a Korean restaurant that specialized in salongtang. 
Uh, we had the Summit Diner, which is, if you've ever been to the Summit Diner in Jersey, it's like a classic, incredible Greek diner in the middle of this super Tony town. Uh, I think we, we were at the Ryland Inn where Craig Sheldon was the chef. We had a whole bunch of, like, stuff. And we just patched it together to a demo reel. And we went to the Food Network first. And they just said, nah, there's, no one's going to understand this in Paducah. They, they said, you don't have sunglasses, spiky <laughs> hair, <laughs> and a goatee. Because it sounds like diners driving and dives to me. That's all I'm saying. They kind of <laughs> they like, they were like, you no, were ahead of your time. No man. one's going to get this in Paducah. And I'm like, okay. And so I went to PBS. Wow. And um, there was a woman there that went on to, she, she was a she, career woman at PBS. Um, and she'd go on to take over Sesame Street. And she said, I, you know, I really like the idea of this show. I mean, you've got, here's our technical standards you're obviously you have to match those right but if you can give us like two or three episodes as a pilot we'll put it up i think it was 1999 right in 2000 and they did it was one show after another i think one was in harlem which we were who was shooting in harlem back then it was a really great show about the old yeah you, you were actually shooting in harlem like harlem harlem like not, not, not upper manhattan no no no, no like, in harlem. In Har <laughs> like like wells famous chicken and waffles where chicken and waffles were invented we did that story right. mrs wells on camera right, right. was deceased so we so we did the we did the harlem story a deli story and then that other thing which i just called breakfast lunch and dinner because we didn't have any money to shoot so we'll breakfast and summer diner lunch at gummy oak dinner at the Ryland <laughs> inn i'll cover it with vios um and they aired, and I remember, like, the Monday after the third show aired, Garrison Botts, who was in programming, called me and said, you know, did you – and this is, again, pre-social media. Did right. you do anything to promote the show? I said, no. It's just, no. You, you aired them. He said, well, your Nielsen's the first day were even with everybody. The second week, they were better. The third week, you, like, crushed it. You had the best Nielsen numbers of the day on that Sunday. Can you do a series? And that was how we got started. It was just like it just dropped in our lap. And then I'm like, okay. Let's do this. And we just, I mean, PBS is weird because they don't buy those shows. It's the only network that does that. So you don't, like, get a contract where they say, hey, do 13 shows. Here's a million bucks. Mm -hmm. They're like, do 13 shows, deliver them on spec, clean, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to be on PBS, which is the, how it works. And, I mean, Lydia, we're all in the same boat. Right. So it's a, what a producer basically does at PBS is go out all year long and raise money. So, you know, we did for uh, eight or nine years. We were on for half a year because that was all I could afford to do was, was uh, mm -hmm. a half a season's worth. And then finally by – in the post-WOR era, I guess, because um, I was also producing that show, and which means raising money. Um, by 2009 or 10, we could get pockets deep enough to do a year's worth of content. And that's, that's how that came. It was just serendipity. It was just like the house – that we bought randomly became right. a neighbor. That, and then I just thought, like, in life, though, it's funny because you have kids, and I have kids, and we'll worry about, you know, this and the school and the mm -hmm. micromanaging and the hovering. And then I think, how'd you meet your wife? Randomly at the CIA, dude. Like, all the big shit that happens is, like, destiny taps you on the shoulder and says, you ready? Or not. Uh, no, absolutely. So that basically this show came out of the fact that I bought a house. Yeah. It just happened to have I a neighbor, that. and that was all serendipity. So that was the story. I love that. So... What were some of your uh, favorite episodes? What were some of the highlights of that? You know, I wish we had the Harlem tape. We don't, because back then, I mean, the, the Copeland's was these old, I, I loved doing that show, because it was really the original old old Harlem stuff. Those were, we did a, a few shows. Those were fun. Uh, the New York shows were great. I mean, in our second season, we went out west and did the French Laundry, and, you know, Keller had never had cameras. I mean, a lot of the places we did had never wow, had cameras. Wow, you Keller? Wow. Yeah, way, way back. Uh, and then when he opened Per Se, we waited for the review to come out, and we did a Per Se episode. Um, you know, all the big boys were kind of fun, but then, you know, like doing K-Town, you know, getting mm -hmm. in there. I remember, like, Gammy Oak, the, the original Gammy Oak. Was, they had a guy that just did their gimshi, and he aged it downstairs and these little things. <laughs> it was so much fun. And then later on, we got to do a bunch of travel shows around wine that were great, where you can actually go to the regions and mm -hmm. kick the tires and, you know, something about, you know, you know where the Alto Adige is and you know the grape varietals, but then when the – when the plane lands and you get in the van and you pile out in Balsan and you start looking around like, what? Wow. The, I'm in the bloody Alps. Right. Look at this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so those were, were really, for me, like eye-opener stuff. We did an Alberino show that was great. It was a grape that I, you know, this is kind of before it popped. We were kind of there trying to promote a bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, Risha Spicious, where is this? It's a part of Spain that the Spanish rail didn't really connect to that part of Spain until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like the Pacific Northwest. It's all conifer trees and cliffs and incredible seafood. So those were some, once we got to do travel shows, those were really some of the, some of the really fun ones to do because they're just, suddenly you have this bigger screen to play with and you're, you know, you're not just 
piling around the streets of New York, but it was just great to be a chronicler of New York talent too, to, to, you know, to tap the, the men and women. I mean, we early on, we did a show with Ann Rosenzweig, female chefs. We've always tried to, you know, represent stuff that wasn't, stories that weren't yep. being told mm -hmm. because that to me was more interesting than whatever else was being out there that everybody knew about already. So you actually said earlier you didn't want to, you don't want to have another, the reference I believe was like a bad porn of, of Mike, does eggplant parmesan so much this was the, so <laughs> much of the, there was the food shows were just a model they were a template yeah it was like you know to, it was like that's what everybody did like this is before the competition shows which honest to god oh my god what, everything's a competition show what, yeah. just shoot me in the head with that shit but this was before they found other models at work so it was basically <laughs> like do we have talent which is what they call that person yeah do we have talent oh, that's exactly. good on camera <laughs> that can just do recipes and it's kind of dump and stir is what we call them you know and so in the course of 30 minutes mike or ming or this guy or right. we'll teach you how to do three dishes and then you can buy the book with a recipe in it yeah. or something and they, it was just they're all they're all the same and then to me the what's interesting about this business is the stories it's the neighborhoods it's why the is that people. so important to you i agree with you but why i definitely can relate to that because like you said okay so i i use it's called the black wine guy experience but obviously it's more than wine i'm here for stories why was it so important for you to tell the stories the whole history of food and the history of wine too is this is this story of of, of travel of change of mm. you know of, of spice trades yep. of culture i mean yep. you know italy didn't have the tom a, a tomato until like the mid what were the italians eating before they had tomatoes right. the koreans didn't have those little red peppers that they would make gochujang with until like the so what were the, what, gim, korean food was white food back then what were, so what are these stories who are the people and you know and in new york just you know you have you can because of the diversity we have you have ethnicities, you have neighborhoods, you have cultures, you have this whole, that's what's fascinating to me, um, is the, the sort of the, not just the chef and the dish, and did you get the shot, you know? Yeah. Did you get yeah. the 50 millimeter shot with the close up of the fettuccine when the stuff, went, no, no, no. What's the story behind this place? How, how did we get here? You know, it's because this, there's this great continuum. It's not just the snapshot. We live in this Instagram world of where were you last night, look at my feed but that's great but there's this long history of food mm -hmm. and i think if people can get sort of uh, t tuned into that it's it, it becomes far more interesting and i and i have to say american food again just a, a shout out and american wine the scene I, I, like i'm at people's wine or i'll go to wild air or contra mm -hmm. with those the, the fabian and, and the jeremiah and you know, I'm sitting in a dining room and I'm surrounded by, I can't tell at my age how old these people are, but they're not, they're like in their 20s. They're barely 30 maybe. <laughs> and they're just, and they're ordering this and that. Or they'll go into a wine store and, you know, I'm looking for some skin contact from the Jura. I'm looking for a Chenin that's, you know, oxidative. I'm looking, what do you have uh, from, uh, you know, I remember the first time <laughs> Alice, Alice, Alice was in uh, was in Georgia, and I'm like peaches, and she's like, no, 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 Georgia, Georgia. that Georgia. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, the birthplace of wine. Oh, that Georgia. Yeah. I mean, so and now people are like amphora. Like, so kids today are so much fucking smarter. Yeah. That, I mean, just like this whole generation. Like, that's like this American thing. Like, once, once we get into something, we go big. And I think that's what's happened with our culture with food. Is it wasn't? I mean, I grew up in the '60s. We were eating TV fucking dinners. Yeah. Like that was a thing. Remember, margarine. Like, like, like my parents used to buy margarine. People moved away from butter to margarine. People used what the tang. Fuck was that? Orange juice was a powder that used to. I mean, the, ast the was astronauts like, use it. Astronauts so. use it. Got to be good. I mean, I remember like there was a thing called TV trays with with little things that would fold up, and you'd sit down for dinner, eating a TV dinner with your family, watching like the news or whatever the hell was on. That was what we did in the foods. Yeah. When I lived through like the worst. If you lived through the '60s in America, that was like the absolute I mean, bottom. Little white bread. Remember white bread? Absolutely devoid of any anything. Anything. Just the food sucked. There yeah, were yeah. anything they could to make it easier and shittier. They did, and we were just canned eating vegetables. It. Yes, I, I, didn't, I don't think I, had a, I don't think I had a frozen vegetable until I was like twenty years old. And my mom was a good cook, but you restaurants know, but, but, serve that stuff, man. Like know. good restaurants serve that stuff. Trust me. I know what was in the kitchen back then. It was like weird, you know, like oh, we'll buy the number ten of Belgian carrots and we'll reduce <laughs> butter and honey and throw some ginger in it. ginger Belgian What the fuck, really, chef? But everybody was doing it. <laughs> so we have just come so far, and in the wine world too, it's amazing. When we used to go to France and go to wine bars, you know, Willie's in the early days, and yeah, you couldn't, you'd come here and there was A, there was nothing like it, but B, those wines weren't here. There just weren't. And now anybody that produces wine anywhere really, like, 
New York's a market they have to be in. Now you go into these great wine shops in the city, and it's just like it's like just an embarrassment of riches. What we have to drink now, it's crazy, and the kids are just dialed into it. it I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, um, that's so crazy. I love, I love that, man. Um, because we forget, right? And I think, and I have. Uh, listeners of all ages, and I got a lot of younger psalms or whatever listening. So I'm, I'm glad they're gonna they're gonna really dig this episode, man. One, because you're shouting them out, but two, they're just gonna learn so much history. You know what I mean? Right. And the chefs too. I mean, you got like you know who Greg Backstrom is, Olmstead in, in Brooklyn. Anyway, yeah. he's, here's this kid who was he got into cooking because he was in the Boy Scouts. He's an Eagle Scout, and believe it or not, he was. A, I'm like, I have asked a million chefs. Hey, no one's ever said to me from the Boy Scouts. So that's that, aw- eh. that's awesome. And then he works at Alenia. He works for Thomas Keller. Da 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 da. He opens up Olmstead in in. Um, Oh, Prospect Heights or one of those book of neighbors. I don't know the name of because they keep changing them. It's where Biggie filmed. The death of outside. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now it's like cool as hell. Right. And, but it's full of white people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, here, and, but this guy, I mean, his menu, there's nothing on, on the menu that's over 20 bucks. The wine list was dope. And the food's just so, and there's, uh, there, there's dozens upon dozens of young chefs like him. Yep. Men and women now who are just doing things that, uh, you know, Victoria blamed me. I, I remember when she was at, she was at Gotham. I didn't eat her food there, but I remember when she was at Chumley's and she wanted to do a lobster roll, but she wanted to do it upscale because it's Chumley's. So she makes pate with lobster stock and powdered milk, and I'm like, no one's going to taste the difference. I mean, pate is enough to make it yourself. Why are you doing it this way? <laughs> because I'm swinging for the fences because that's how I am. I mean, there's just so much talent out there now. It's just the restaurant, the food scene, the restaurant scene, it's never been better. We are just living in a golden time. And I hate to see it's coming out of the pandemic. I'm not sure how we're going to how we're gonna come out of this hole. That's a question that remains to be answered, which we haven't gotten to yet. Well, that's the next question. But before we go there, I was going to say, um, what kind of influence do you think your show had or what kind of influence would you like to think that show had, man? You know, it's – I am – I'm luckier than I would have ever imagined – with to have been given the opportunity and the platforms I've had. None of it was planned. Um, you know, earned or deserved, you can debate that all you want, but somehow it was just serendipitous. So it's so like like the Raza guy, you know, Dan was in Maplewood. He had a restaurant. He was trying to get me, hey, gotta come in. You know, or I'll go into a kitchen. A f- a f- historical story. We're filming with Missy Robbins, who I'm a huge fan. I knew Missy when she did a voce, when she replaced Andrew Carmelini, which was a big deal. I mean, I remember her PR firm was like, you got to come try the new a voce. I'm like, no, 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 that was Andrew Carmelini's restaurant. Nobody can do this. Well, this is girl named I never heard of Missy Robbins. <laughs> never. Missy who? All right, all right, all right. So, so Jennifer Baum takes me there for lunch, and the food's unbelievable. And Missy's just a fucking badass. So I'm like, all right, she's great. You're right. I was wrong. She's fantastic. So, so we're filming at Missy. A second time I filmed with her. We're, we're out in Brooklyn at MISI at a restaurant. And we're filming also. We're doing a couple shoots. And the last segment of that day is going to be like the B-roll of service at Missy. So we come in with a light crew. We're rolling all the gear in through. They're in service. I'm dragging the cameras, getting the mics, getting the lobs, making sure the cameras are changed. All right, you could, so you could do a white balance. You do a white balance, making sure we got all the shit together. And Missy taps me in the back and says, hey, there's somebody that wants to meet you at the bar. And I'm like, oh, I'm, give me a minute because we got to get the crew rolling. It was fucking action, Bronson. <laughs> so I'm like, what? Now, I know action because my kids love him, and I, I love rap. I don't mm-hmm. really know his rap, but mm-hmm. I knew him from TV. I mean, right. he's, you know, smoking whatever he smokes, watching <laughs> Ancient Aliens and getting paid. And then he was kind of like munchies. He blew up. So we did this thing with action, and he's like, I grew up watching you and Ming and Jacques Pepin. I mean, you guys are like the you. And I'm like, I'm like that, if I fucking die today. That's good. That's, That's awesome. cool. And Action asked me on his Instagram. I'm like, I'm not, so suddenly my kid's friends are like, dude, your dad's on Action Bronson's Instagram. <laughs> so, I mean, it's weird. So it's had this thing like right. the old guys I love because I've been a champion. Then. But then you got these young kids. You know, a lot of them watch PBS and a lot of them watch cooking. And like it or not, they ended up by default watching me. And it's just so fun to see that. It's just like, yikes, who knew? That's so fun. 
What was that show you had? Uh, Fuck That's Delicious. It was a great show. Yeah, it was a great show. Yeah, it yeah. was funny because it yeah. broke, a, a, once again, it, you know, it's back when Vice was doing cool shit. Yep. It was like, yep. you know, suddenly it was like the camera doesn't have to exactly be in the focus. And yep. uh, it, uh, oh, it was like, you're in my shot. So, so what if the camera's in the shot? Who right. gives a shit? Right. Everyone knows cameras are shooting it. I, Why so can't, true. right? It was just like, let's do bare bones, raw, bare knuckle food show and just make it funny. And his personality is just larger yeah, than perfect, life. Man. He was perfect. He was perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, so you you've been you're just like easy you're like the easiest guest like you like this is a, you could tell a pro pro right like oh stop no dude like stop. literally like unless you hack my my email <laughs> like you've just followed our show notes <laughs> um so yeah what are your thoughts on the curse state of restaurants how how do you think because you, you mentioned this way 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 back about over an hour ago but what do you think is going to be necessary to, to come out of uh, a whole lot? It, it sucks. Yeah. It sucks. So, two things. Back of the house, you know, m my generation, it was like a badge of honor to work seventy-five hours and get paid for thirty-five. Right. It was just like that's what you did. Yep. I mean, I can't tell you the stories. Of third degree burns on my thigh. Stay, finish service that night. Thing blows up. Go to the doctor. It's a scab. He says, "Wait till the scab breaks, then you're going to put silvadina." You don't miss a day. Right. So just, that's what you did. It was like it was like the Marines. It was like the special op forces mm -hmm. people. That's a and that and it was a very male macho testosterone fueled scene. I mean, remember when I graduated with the CIA? Women weren't working on the hotline. Still, that's how my wife ended up in pastry. Wow. <laughs> when we got out of the CIA, it was like you could do salads or pastry. You could wow. do garmage or pastry. And that's why so many great pastry kitchens like Claudia Fleming, where suddenly there was all these great pastry kitchens in New York. So back of the house has to get paid more money. It's just not fair what restaurant workers make, period. It's, it's not fair. A, that's A. And that means prices are going to have to go up in menus too, A. Yep. Yep. And then B, the, like the toxic, this, you know, we had the thing with the Psalm Me Too thing that broke yeah. a couple of years ago. Yep. And I remember, you know, Pascaline, she didn't organize, but it was a get-together of her scene of a bunch of industry, uh, industry wine people. Yannick Benjamin was there. There's a couple of guys. Um, and I remember, they, and everyone had to introduce themselves. It was mostly female Psalms, and I just remember saying, hey, I'm just here to listen. You know, I'm not, I have nothing to bring to this table. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted to say was, this business has always sucked. And it's always been exploitive, and it's always been a really bad space for women. Mm. There's just too many guys, too much testosterone, mm -hmm. too too much drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's just a really bad scene. And I think that sort of that sort of power dynamic too has to change. Mm -hmm. There has to be more of an accommodation for not just gender equality, but just like let's make restaurants a more civilized place to work because mm -hmm. they haven't been. They've really existed. I mean, the one thing. The, maybe the the greatest of all the great things that Anthony Bourdain did. I remember I was living in Cape May then, when, and I was su subscribing to the New Yorker, and that article comes out, and I read it, and I'm just like, who the fuck is this? Because everybody else that was writing about food was like a Columbia journalism right. school, who like rosy glasses, you know, like the, no, 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 this mofo nailed it. It sucks. Re kitchens are full of misfits and drunks and drug addicts. The conditions are disaster. And it, honestly, it hasn't moved as in as much as the you know. I mean, HR wasn't a department when I was there. So <laughs> that stuff has to happen. Right. Restaurants have to become you know better environments for front of the house for women and for back of the house for pay. And it's going to be a real, really weird growing pain. I mean, I don't know anybody in New York right now that's reopened that that is close to fully staffed. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And that's going to be part of the thing. And we'll see what happens. We'll see how many restaurants can make it out of it because I uh, think the other problem is people are going to have to pay more for food because it just – it doesn't work. The model just doesn't work the way it's been. Um, you you can't have back-of-the-house people making the kind of shit wages they do, and, and you can't have the kind of sexual harassment that's been rampant. I mean, well, Victoria was on your show, and, yep. you know, Wine Girl was just this damning <laughs> testimonial, and everybody knows those stories. Yep, yep. And um, it's it's atrocious. Um, what do you think about, you know, so we have this understaffing issue, and then now um, the uh, proof of vaccination, which I'm for, but I mean, what do you, I mean, like, you think that's, gonna, I've, I would have to think that's going to affect uh, business somewhat. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I don't know what's going to be in the city. I mean, New York City, we're pretty, I think my neighborhood is 72%, 73 I'm on the Lower East Side, so my zip code is 1002. I think we're 72%. Mm -hmm. I mean, New York is... I'm a member of the New York Athletic Club. I just came, you know, really fancy old mm -hmm. private. New York, New York AC. The NYAC. I've been a member. They brought, back in the 80s, there was 10,000 members, so you, they'd had, they could not take new members. 
And Mark Sarazan, who ran the old DeBragan Spitler, Mark Sr., brought me in as a boxer. Because if you could come in as a te- if you could fight. Athlete. Yeah. Right. If you come as an athlete, you got a scholarship, yep. an athletic scholarship. And that kind of got me in the back door. Um, but, yeah, the, the – um, and so when our club reopened, I remember, like, at some point they decided, oh, okay, we're going to re- – you don't have to wear a mask anymore in the gym or in the club. And I was thinking, why? And I remember I wrote the GM like an email. I got one of the doormen and said, oh, what's, who's the GM of this club? What's his address? I said, why, why don't you ask for proof? I mean, like, I'm in the gym working out, and there's a kid next to me that I know is a private high school kid. He's a rich kid. Mm-hmm. He's not wearing a mask. I guarantee you that kid's not vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And these are the kids that are carrying the shit. Right. Because they're not going to get sick. They're asymptomatic right. or they're mildly right. sick. Right. I, didn't get th- I didn't get this far to be on the bench press getting sick from some kid next to him. Yep. And he's like, well, you know, it's a private club, and that's a personal space, and it, there's a lot of this. Just pop and, and now, finally, the New York Athletic Club is doing it. Now, th- th- I just got an email, I think, last night that you're going to have to send them proof of vax. Otherwise, mask up. So, I mean, that's great. Where The rest of the country, I have no idea. I mean, you got, yeah. you know, you got Abbott, and you've got the guy in Florida. What's that client? DeSantis. I mean, what the fuck? Like, you know, like science deniers? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't even get it. I, I mean, th- I, I think in New York it's great because yeah. I, w- when restaurants reopened and I was vaxxed and my kids are vaxxed because yeah. I eat at my son lives in Queens and with his girlfriend and we used to eat that once a month all year long. And then we went, you know, 16 months without seeing yeah. each other because yeah. that's the way the world was. Yep. And when we finally went out, we said, let's go outdoors, let's go outdoors. And then we finally, you know, wanted to do an indoor thing. And I'm like, wouldn't it be nice to know that everybody that's in this Correct. room right. is vaxxed right. because we got this far. Why take a chance? Mm-hmm. We'll see what happens in New York, but I think that's the least of our problems. I think the bigger problem is going to be getting staffed and getting restaurants to be able yeah. to yeah. work as that well-oiled machine that right. can do the kind of covers that they used to do with that kind of fluidity and you know uh, professional service, both in the front and the back. Yeah. Um, but I, I think for that to happen, the industry is going to kind of have to reinvent itself, and it's been a long time coming. It really should. Restaurants have been existing in this sort of other space for far too long, and I don't think – the general public gets it, um, you know, just how exploitative the business has been, relying on hours worked. I mean, even these, even some of these, you know, these great restaurants. I did it. I did a stagiaire in France who worked for free. And, you know, I don't want to wonder how many kids in the kitchen at Per Se or EMP or did it. You know, there's a percentage of those kids that are probably working for nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that's, a, that's a funny business model. I'm not saying it isn't worth it on, uh, on an educational level. But right. I mean, it's right. just a funny business that's always relied on this kind of weird, you know, n- n- ethical things that in any other business wouldn't be allowed to happen. Right, right. No, that's, I agree. I agree. So, like, what are you doing these days for your food content? Are you creating any new food content? What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what's, what are you working on? Um, I eat. I cook. <laughs> I go out to restaurants. I mean, we're we're living in such a I mean, now the yeah, now the restaurants are back open again. And 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 basically my whole Instagram feed of who I follow or just everybody in the industry that's interesting yeah. and these Instagrammers, you know, like I like Michael Chow. I don't know what this guy does for last year. I got I met him. But I mean, this guy just seems to eat out all the time. Yeah, I know. There's some people I'm like what the fuck does this guy do? Man? Right, like the A, all I know does, that's expensive. All he does, all he How does could you, is you, you, caviar. Donuts, and, or, there's that, and then there's like the donut shop in Queens and the sandwich place. So I'm like, do you have a day, do you have any kind of a job? Mm. And I guess they spend like a couple of days accumulating content and then just dropping it piecemeal. Yeah. But whatever, but it's great because it's an eye opener to me to see what's happening and what's going on because um, I've been on the lower, I used to live in the West Village for, for most of the aughts until 2012. And then I moved to the Lower East Side. I'm on Grand Street in those co-ops down there. And um, I just love that neighborhood because we're walking distance to Chinatown proper. Uh, and then there's that buffer neighborhood of, like, East Broadway, Division Street, Canal Street. It's servos. It was, it was kind of like, you know, a mashup of really talented young people coming in doing really cool restaurants and Chinatown. And then you go north of Delancey into the Lower East, and you just have all this great stuff going on that's – I mean, I just can't wait to get – come September. I mean, this summer has been a bit of a a drag because of the uh, the COVID stuff. And i got to tell you, the, the heat, you know, for me, it's just – Listen, I it's mean, been one of the hottest summers yeah, I ju- ever remember. July sucked. July sucked. And then I usually thought – like, when we had this interview, I'm like, oh, August, it'll probably be cooler that day. Right, and, when we were emailing. And yeah. then, like, literally, if you <laughs> go to the National Oceanographic site, there's, like – heat weather advisory warning for new york city yeah it's 94 but it feels like 102 stay inside 
Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I can't wait for the weather to break and get back on the bike. And there's just a ton of new places I want to try that are that are new and fun. And people like there's this is double chicken please joint where these guys, I guess they had a pop up. And then because of COVID, they had to scale down. So they were doing like drinks, mixed drinks on tap and a couple of really cool fried. And now they got a back room where they're actually doing like a menu menu that just looks great. I mean, I, I don't, I'm just I can't wait for fall and getting out again and. And not and, and not having to get off my bicycle and think this is the third shower of the day that I need to take before I go out again. So I, I can't wait to just hit the city again and pound the pavements. So, like when you do that, will you be like scouring um, the city or just you go you go to places because you want to go to them and then like if it strikes you, you do a bite a segment on the bite. Like for yeah. instance, you did a you did one I saw the other day about a, a chicken fried chicken sandwiches. So tell tell about what your your opinion on fried chicken sandwiches because that's <laughs> been a topic on my podcast. It's so funny. Um, so like Popeyes, right? That's what happened. So Popeyes comes out two years ago, and there was like a shooting. <laughs> there were lines out <laughs> that's the door. Right? It was like Air Jordans. It was nuts, man. It was like what the hell? It's a freaking chicken sandwich at Popeyes. So suddenly it's on my radar, and I got a Popeyes by me. Um, I think, well, the one I went to was off to, just off Canal Street. Um, people say it's a good Popeye's. I didn't know there was any difference. Oh, that's a great Popeye's. I'm like, <laughs> is the difference? Just, just the so I went there, and it was like a $6. It was like six fifty. It was fantastic. It was just great. I get it. It's like a fried, crunchy chicken sandwich with pickles and stuff. And it's and on every level, it's satisfying, and it's cheap, and it's fast. Like, yeah. you want more than that? Sorry. Can't do. Um, so then I just started to do research. Like, okay. So... F- I did one I, – I know so little about fast food. I actually did a, a bite. So when I record those things, I do them in my apartment off an iPad, yep. and I usually do five versions of each bite, upload them. They go to Channel 13. They pick the one they like. They put the front end, the back end, and out it goes. But there's no editing. Okay. It has to be a clean 50 seconds. So the first time I did the Chick-fil-A, I was calling it Chick-fil-A. That's how it's <laughs> fucking spelled. And my producer, like, I get this email, like, because she hates she, – the only way to do this is to reshoot them. And she's like, Mike, I'm so sorry. I got your upload the other day. It's pronounced Chick-fil-A. So why the fuck don't they spell it that way? <laughs> it's, it's spelled Chick-fil-A. Because you're from fucking Georgia, man. Jesus, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. So anyway. Chick-fil-A. So finally, I had one of their sandwiches. And it I, – I mean, I don't know. Like, there was a really long line, and I got people behind me in front of me. And I get there, and I'm like, uh, I'll have a chicken sandwich. Was, that was all they said. And there was some sauces you could have gotten on the side, I guess. So that's new. Because Ch- Chick-fil-A was the original chicken sandwich. And it, it was it was the pickles, the bun, and the chicken. That's all it is. So so now, but like, you know, I, 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 I grab a Chick-fil-A often before I come in the studio. So I don't get yeah, there's banged one here. up. Yeah, there's I don't one here get, I don't, like, yeah, I don't get banged up. Right. Cause, cause I, like, I had a banana before I yeah. came here. I went to a bodega and had a banana yeah, before yeah, I yeah, you know, confessed that's, that. That's, but, um... But like they said, would you like any sauce? I'm like, what sauce? What it was just a sandwich. Put, like, like put it on the sandwich. Man. Yeah, like yeah. What do you mean? Like? Right. So it's like you go to the restaurant, the steak comes, and then then they ask yeah. do you one. Well, what the fuck? Yeah. How is that an option now? So I didn't get the sauce, and it was basically like bland on bland. Right. It was a chicken breast on a white piece of bunny thing. So you just have butter, butter and a pickle, the, butter and a pickle. But was, now, didn't like it. Yeah. And I did a bite on that, and I got a sh- I, I said, do not re-air that bite. I got so much incoming flack from around the country I'm sure saying, you, did. you New York liberal, you hate the... Well, I was going to say, because... Oh, yeah, because yeah. the Christian <laughs> values, and oh, you <laughs> devil-worshipping, baby-blood-eating, God-knows pedophile, right? <laughs> what the heck? Don't... I mean, 25%... Because I said it was bland on bland, and somebody said, that's like a Bob Dylan pun. Bland on bland. I didn't mean it to be that way. Wow. But to me, it was. But I mean, 75% of the incoming was just... You're, you're the most horrible guy in the world. And then I went, and then Dan, Danny Meyer has one at Shake Shack, and I had that, and it was breast meat again. I don't know. I think a chicken sandwich, to me, should be like a boneless chicken thigh. That's to me. I like the dark meat. I'm like, chicken breast, like what? Like, why bother? And you're frying it, like, especially why bother? Um, the guys at Contra Wilder have a great one. They do, because they, they did that weird, like, during the whole pandemic time, I don't know if you follow those guys, but they were doing like these crazy donuts that was like, they blew the Instagram with like, don't, every week they would have this nutty donut and it would go for sale at like Saturday at noon and they would sell, I don't know how many hundreds in 15 minutes, yeah. gone. Yep. And that's how they kind of kept the lights on was doing the, these really silly, not silly, delicious, but you know, this is these are, you know, kind of Michelin starred guys. Right. Doing like casual approachable fast casual on orchard street just chicken sandwiches and egg sandwiches and funny stuff but yeah the chicken sandwich is funny and then mcdonald's has one now yeah mcdonald's has one now it sucks um i haven't tried it 
um, because I was going to do my own study. Um, Burger King, the Chick King, they've got their new hand breaded, you know, nonsense. But no, I I I I, I love those bite segments, um, you know, and I, I I just saw that one recently, and you're like, for me, I think, uh, you know, and I've become a fan of the uh, boneless, skinless breast. Well, there are people. I mean, they're. I was actually talking to some chef friends of mine and said, Mike, if you think about it, they're like the perfect shape. Like, because the actual boning a chicken breast is really very, very easy to do for most people versus the thigh, which is a couple of cuts, and then you got to wiggle that little bone out. I mean, for chefs, it might not seem like much, but if you're doing thousands a day, it's something. But, um, yeah, the chicken sandwich, man, who knew? It just took America by storm. It's like, what happened? Exactly. Everybody has to have them. Like, everybody has to have them. Uh, that's like another thing I didn't see coming with those fake meat burgers. Like, what? Did you oh, ask yeah. me three years ago? Like, I mean, I remember like back in the day, like on purpose, like buying Boca burgers. Remember those? They were in the freezer yep. section. Because yep. they were like this really easy, like in the summer, it's hot. I don't want to cook. I don't want any BTUs. I remember I put them in my toaster, yep. frozen, and they would come out of the toaster crispy. <laughs> and then I would have like, you know, a potato roll and put some Duke's mayonnaise. And damn, that was good. But then this, this like soy bean meat. Shit. Yeah. yeah, that actually like bleeds and stuff. Like they use beet dye. Like it's weird, meat. man. And then you read the ingredients, and it's not. I mean, honestly. Well, that's I used to see. I used to be a vegetarian, vegan. I play around, but then there, I, one day I woke up. I'm like, there's like twenty ingredients in this. And the first is like grass fed beef. And what it's am like I doing? And the first ingredient is some sort of soy that they have so emulsified that whatever right. nutritional value may, that may have had is gone. And also, soya is a monocrop, which is not a good thing for farming. Yeah. Um, and then the next two ingredients are fat and fat. And then, like, water. And then also the methyl cellulose starches <laughs> to keep it together. And, like, really? It's like yeah. Frankenstein shit. Yeah. Like, like, do you, like you. Like, give me, like, a little smack. I used to be, it's like, back in the day, like, when I was younger, I used to, it was a style. We eat those big, thick, juicy, medium, rare blood burgers, right? Right, right. And now... I'm a smash burger Dude, guy. Completely. Now I want them like as thin as yep. I can get them. They have to be well done, yep. crispy, That's and they so weigh funny. like an ounce and a half. That's so funny. I'm saying like that was the thing. Like it was like three quarter ounce burger, and then like the blood is in the bun, and you know, and you can't. And the, the what is that? The beef steak tomato, and like, you can't even get your mouth. It's right. like totally like a guy for anything. But like now I'm like, give me a smash burger. I'm yeah. putting on the grill. Uh, I I love Oklahoma burgers. And I, you know, I gone back to American cheese. Fuck all the fancy no, cheese. No, no, American it, it cheese smells like American cheese. Yeah, nothing right like American cheese. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of mayonnaise, some lettuce, and a good pickle in there. And I don't know how you can go wrong with that. So that's, yeah, that's where taste is gone. So you're spending your time between your home here and your place down in Cape May. Yeah. Um, like, uh, what's a day? What's a current day in the life of Mike Cole like these days? <laughs> this is going to really sound boring, everybody. <laughs> this is the part of the if – you, if you, even if you've listened this far, just turn it off now. <laughs> now, I warn you. No, it's so – you know, uh, um, I am so rudderless and without ambition that it's almost embarrassing. I don't have a lot to actually do. So the bites are sort of like – anytime I keep like a notebook around, and anytime I hear a good food story, I just like write that shit down and do a little homework and – squeeze that into a minute that'll work and that's the job and then recording those initially so channel 13 set up a little studio this was pre-covid because they wanted cheap content that mm -hmm. was disposable which is kind of what everybody wants in news today <laughs> so they came down and they set up an ipad with uh, some lighting and some sound gear and some ibm software that allows me to record them and then upload them to channel 13 without seeing anybody so it, initially it took me a little while to get 50 seconds clean without any hiccups you know you guys do production uh, it, it doesn't sound like a lot but it, it's tv you got to look at the camera you got to be on point and don't make a mistake and you know the, and i've got i also there's i got the subway outside there's noise i have to be cognizant of but anyway so i mean my day is like like a, like a like a cat's day <laughs> like yarn like do i want to do the yarn or the nap do i want to do the walk on the soft sand or the swim in the ocean or both. And then, of course, what's for dinner? This is I know this is terrible. This is like the worst. And then what am I drinking tonight with dinner? That's the best. No, it's, so it's literally like the, the New Yorker cartoon, like with the two cats looking at each other and one says, should I nap now or should I wait 15 minutes? That's sort of like the Michael Mecco day, which I know. So coming from a guy that worked like six, seven days a week as a lunatic, to me, this is like winning the lotto. Oh, and, and 
just to rub it in. But I'm old and I kind of earned it. I, I live on the Lower East Side, which I absolutely adore. And New York, I adore. I just I can't wait for like the Village Vanguard to reopen. Huge fan of that club specifically as a jazz venue. Um, I think they're going to make it through this thing. I hope. I took, actually, I, I owe Jed an email or a text. Um, but, you know, living in Manhattan and living in Cape May is just like the best of both worlds. You know, yeah, this is a two-and-a-half, three-hour drive, but who gives a hell? It's up to go down the parkway. I do it off hours. I pretty much know the drill uh, unless there's an accident or something. I don't hit it when it's high traffic. Um, and Manhattan's just this, you know, I don't know. I'd argue that I've been a lot of places. I can't. I mean, Paris is pretty cool, but I'm not French. You know, Manhattan's like the greatest city there is to me. Um, and being able to be here and be part of this food, wine community, and then go to Cape May and just be like nature boy. I mean, a lot of people down there don't even know what I do, which is the other cool and That's got to be cool, right? It's really funny. Like, no one, like, up here, like, so where do you live? How much money do you make? What do you pay for rent? You know, <laughs> down there, it's like, hey, man, you been surfing at all? Like, any <laughs> waves? You get any stripers? Or, hey, when you're out, did you get stung by any jellyfish today? Or, and the bird guys are all doing, like, their bird thing or some crazy... You know, we had we had a Herman's gull show up in Cape May three months ago. It's a complete West Coast gull. It should have never been here. It lives between San Diego and Mexico. It's and the a little Cal- lost. It, yeah, it just its brain went fucked up and it made the <laughs> wrong turn and ended up in Cape May. But like, if you're a birder, you're like, wow. The people were driving in for like a hundred miles. So, so then the birders down there are just like so cool because they're like these nature guys. They're just like you walk around and you you walk the trails with them and they could name like everything. Like they can hear this thing and go, oh yeah, that's this thing and that's that thing. See that thing? And that's this thing. And that's a young female. Blah blah blah. That's an immature. It's just it's 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 just crazy cool. It's, it's like fun. that movie, A uh, Big Year. Was it Steve Martin and Jack Black? You see that? I have not seen that. Oh, but it was God. a birding thing. Yeah, it was a birding. Yeah, exactly. it was the same type of. Well, thing. they have. We have. There's like a. There's like a 24 hour. Epic, it was the World Series of Birding. They do it every. <laughs> no, there's a thing. I know. No, I got, believe. No, it's been birding's getting big now, which is cool, and I'm all for it. I just wish it was a little more diverse because the truth is, most birders are geriatric white people with too many clothes on. If you've never seen them, they're like they got the hat that covers their neck with the thing in the back. God forbid they get some sun on the back of their <laughs> neck. Their pants are tucked into their socks uh, they all look like they came out of an aarp commercial on a bad day um but you know they're they're stewards of the community so i wish it would get a little younger and a little more ethnically diverse but the bir- birding's cool as shit birding is really something like once you get like again you buy a pair of binoculars and and like where i live you just go outside i mean we got everything living down there now it's, it's fun that's so that's the answer the answer is now like literally yeah whatever the it. fuck i want yeah i work out <laughs> I, I gotta do like i gotta do one thing a week which is load up bites and yeah. that takes all of an hour and a half if i'm slow and then it's just like where are we eating tonight and what are we drinking for dinner and what kind of workout are we gonna do i know it's ridiculous uh, well you said it though man like you worked so many years Six, I kind of did. Week, I kind of, you, you know, like when I think back, like to be a line cook at the Four Seasons and the Maurice yeah, at I've the same time. That. No, that was, Shit. I literally remember at some point, and back then, like, we were working, like, we didn't wear, like, Birkenstock clogs. Right, there was no Crocs. No, no, I had fucking, I used to get, like, construction <laughs> boots out of a catalog. I remember, like, they were, like, steel toe leather lace-ons, and I remember, like, towards the end of that, Towards the end of that six months, like I remember getting up and my feet really, like in the morning, my feet fucking hurt. Like I was just killing myself. Mm-hmm. But it was, and then of course, you know, you'd run from the Four Seasons to get to the Maurice and Christian, you know, oh, you're late, you're late, you're late. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Oh, 75 covers tonight, Michel. You get your shit together, okay? Ah, oh, merde. Ah, putain de manon. Yeah, we we had many years of, of all that. And then running a restaurant, like volunteer slavery. My wife and I would just work seven days a week. Yeah. Seven bloody days a week. We lived up above the store for the first two years. Yeah. I mean, shit, the year she was pregnant, she would, I think she was working a week before she had a baby. Mm. Yeah, Sean was born in the September, and we closed the restaurant a week before. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 sorry. I, yes, I'm a lazy bum, and I do what I want, but come on. <laughs> come on, I'm freaking ancient, and I deserve it at this point. I kind of earned a, earned the cat's life. <laughs> Oh, my God, Mike. It's so awesome sitting down and talking with you, man. Fuck. So many stories. Um, we're going to have to do it again for sure. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks uh, thanks for you. Thank people for listening. Thanks so much for thinking of me and reaching out. I appreciate it. No. And your guest list. Have been, I mean, you had Pat, Pat Yello, Capiello here. I'm looking at who's been coming in. I'm like, yeah, yeah I know all these cats. Yeah, and yeah. they're all so they're all so different, and they've all got yeah. such great stories. We've been lucky, man. I'm just I'm, – I'm, I'm feeling blessed and, you know um, – yeah, I. You know, it was funny. I don't know. I can't. You started following me, so I was like, "Oh shit!" I go to my wife. I go, "Oh my god, look, Mike Cullen Echoes following me." So I was like, I followed him back, and I sent him a DM, and he responded. I was like, "Oh, I was like, oh my god, I'm so excited." So, um, 
No, really, thank you for being here. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, how they can be a part of uh, what you do at PBS, et cetera, so oh, on. I don't know. Just, you know, PBS, the bite it shows up. If you watch the weekend cooking blocks, we're after every single show. And I'm on Instagram as myself, I think. Yeah, I you are. Know. Just as yourself. Yeah, there's no No, no blue check. No, it's, it's him. No, and then Facebook, which I check once a day to see. Do you have a website? You got Michael and Michael Not Duncan? really. No. I love it. I love no. it. Old school. Yeah. Sorry, folks. I uh, don't be sorry, man. Nothing Listen, exciting Mike. exciting here. No, so exciting. Thanks for sharing these stories with us, spending some time with us. By the way, this fucking wine is delicious. It's fun. I mean, it's very different, right? It's way different. It's it's, it's grapey. It's really it's simple. Got all, it's really juicy. It's simple. Yeah. It's 12.5% ABV. It's delivering a lot of flavor. It's great on its own. I'm sure great with any type of food, cheeses, blah, blah, blah. But uh, thank you so much for bringing this, sharing a bottle of wine with me. And... Uh, Look, man, um, anytime you want to come back. Now, unfortunately, you're on my radar. Somebody bothering you. Bother like, me, bother that, me. That was a great section of the bite. Um, but everybody, thank you so much for listening. Until the next time, cheers to the Mavericks, the philosophers, the deep thinkers, and to all you wine drinkers out there. It's MJ. Peace. Clean cut. And we're out. We're out. <laughs>